Hey guys, today I've got a very special presentation for us all to enjoy. Uh, I've, I've figured it out. After many sleepless nights, I have devised a system to determine indisputably who is the better writer. Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin or the, or the author of Dune. Frank Herbert. These guys are both giants of fantastical fiction, two of the most influential authors ever in science fiction and fantasy. Titans of their respective genres. Game of Thrones and Dune are two of the most beloved stories among nerds all over the world. But who's better? Who writes better? I've devised a system, and we're going to be using a book called 100 Ways to Write Badly Well by Joel Stickley. And basically what this book is, is it, it, it's like a list of common mistakes and cliches and like forms of bad writing. And each, each like kind of bad writing has a nice little written example of like what this crappy writing can be like. It's a very funny, creative, informative book about writing. 100 Ways to Write Badly Well, I suggest you go check it out. But what we're doing today is we're going to go through this list of writing mistakes. And every time George R. R. Martin or Frank Herbert is guilty of this particular mistake, we're going to give them a point. We're going to give them one point on the bad writer score. And after we've been through all of these 100 bad writing ticks, each writer is going to have a score out of 100. So we're going to have a mathematical measurement, an, an, a completely unquestionable, incontrovertible mathematical measurement of how bad of a writer George and Frank are. So I'm thrilled to find out the, the truth. We're performing a scientific experiment together here, guys. We're going to find out the truth once and for all, and I'm excited to learn what it is. And I want to hear from you guys' like, opinions, because it is going to be like subjective. Uh, you know, whether or not George and Frank are guilty of each of these things. So we're going to discuss them, we're going to figure them out. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll have a look at what's going on in the chat uh, so we can figure it out. Uh, Smash Davo says that George Martin never wrote about his experiences on shrooms, so that's already poor form from my perspective. That's true, but George Martin talks a lot about uh, Shade of the Evening and, like, the drug trips that result from, from that particular drug. Um, so there's definitely something going on there. Um, and yeah, of course, Frank Herbert loves describing, uh, drug trips on the, on Spice and the Water of Life and Sappho and everything else. Um, so, so that, there, there are a lot of similarities between, between these two writers. I mean, both of them have vast worlds with lots of sort of world building, very epic scope. These are stories that take place over very like large, um, large scale worlds, and they both have medieval politics going on in their settings. Um, they both have a tendency towards darkness, I would say. Like there is a sort of a grim cynicism uh, or like realism, you, you might call it, in their worlds. Both of them have a certain amount of you know, murder, intricate politics, subplots, intrigue. And yeah, there's the dark, you know, the, the, there are villains who torture and murder. Um, but there's also a, a certain amount of heroism. I would say that a difference is that George Martin is a romantic. George Martin loves the the, the, the color and the knights and, and, and the knightly virtues and like the fantastical and the colorful descriptions. Like George Martin really enjoys the the sensual... Uh, you know, the foods, the smells, the colors. Um, he, he's really in interested in engaging our senses. Whereas Frank Herbert is much more interested in engaging our brain. He's much more interested um, in exploring these very specific philosophical ideas about like self-development, human potential, self-control, self-mastery, and environmentalism and religion and politics. Like Frank Herbert is much more sort of cerebral and much more sort of academic in his in his thoughts that he's trying to convey through his work. Whereas George Martin, I think, is more about just genuinely enjoying the story for the story's sake. Um, another similarity between George and Frank is that they're 
their most popular series are unfinished. George Martin has not finished the Game of Thrones books. He's written five books, he says there's two more coming, and they've been coming for more than a decade. Uh, Frank Herbert died before writing the 7th June book. Um, he was writing more, but but unfortunately he died before he could finish his masterwork, his, his Dune series. So there are lots of similarities between George and Frank. There are also some interesting differences. So I think it's going to be fascinating to determine once and for all who is the better author using this methodology. All right, so let's do it. We're going to go through these 100 points one by one uh, to figure out who has the highest bad writer score. We're going to determine whether each of these authors is guilty of each of these writing mistakes. So let's begin with number one. The number one writing mistake is beginning your novel with the protagonist getting out of bed and seeing that it is raining outside, which perfectly mirrors his life. Um, so this is a common cliche, I guess, is when like a protagonist wakes up in the morning and that's how you start the book. Uh, and they're sort of also using this cliche of like, oh, it's raining outside and that means my life is sad. Um, and it's sort of this idea of like using some like lazy metaphor or symbolism to show how your protagonist's life sucks and like therefore you should care about them. And I don't think I don't think George or Frank are guilty of this. I, I can't think of um, at least in George's writing, I can't think of many times when like a ch even a chapter starts with um, a character waking up in bed. But I mean, the start of Dune does have Paul Atreides in bed. Um, he hasn't just woken up though it's when like the witch comes in and like visits him while he's like pretending to be asleep in bed and it does rain later early on in dune but i i i don't think we can say that frank is guilty of um of this particular cliche uh and neither is george so let's move on does the chat agree um steven says that both frank and george are weirdos um that's what literally happened in the beginning of the movie now said yeah at the start of the june movie um it was raining at the beginning when when paul was in bed and yeah he did wake up and get out of bed uh so yeah that's true maybe denny villeneuve should get a point on the bad writing score uh but uh, i don't think frank is guilty of that specifically oh and by the way like there will be spoilers for like the first half of the first Dune book in this live stream. There will probably also be some spoilers for the later Dune books. I will warn you before I drop any spoilers for the later Dune books. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. All right. Number two, both of our authors ha have zero bad writing points yet. They're both doing pretty well. So let's move on to point two. I'm really ex like, who's going to pull ahead first? You know, who's going to get the first bad writing point? Can't wait. Use as many adjectives as you can. So when people use too many adjectives, so so the example uh, by Joel Stickley here is she slowly walked the slow winding path towards the crooked, rundown old house. So using just lots of unnecessary, repetitive um, adjectives. I I you know I th I mean George Martin can get a bit flowery sometimes. George Martin can sometimes use you know in his sort of vivid descriptions. You know, sometimes even with landscapes and with food and stuff, you know, he, he can be a little bit flowery. Um, I, I don't think we'd call him... I mean, we can, we can take a look at A Song of Ice and Fire real quick. Like, like let's just get a random sample of, of an A Song of Ice and Fire paragraph. Here's a Daenerys chapter. Uh, here's a Ned chapter. Ned ignored them in his haste. He crossed the castle yard. He would have run, but he, he needed dignity. The castle was a modest holding. I mean, you know, there's there's not even all that many adjectives going on here. I, I don't think we can say that George is guilty of using too many adjectives. The, the sausages sizzled and spit over fire pits, spicing the air with scents of garlic and pepper. You could almost get him for that. Spicing the air with the scents of garlic and pepper. I mean... I mean, we know they're spices, George. You don't need to say that, that, that they have spicy scents. You can't say, I'm spicing the the air with the scenty spices of the s spiced garlic and scenty pepper. It's a little... It, we could almost ding him for that. But, you know, I'm not... I'm going to let him off for this one. I don't think he's quite guilty. It was all of golden silk, the largest and grandest structure in the camp. 
an immense iron shield. Yeah, I'd, I think he's using an appropriate number of adjectives. So we're not going to ding him for that. All right. And, and, and Frank, meanwhile, I, I think Frank doesn't use enough adjectives. I, th I, I think that Frank is, is not descriptive enough, if anything. Um, I mean, sometimes when he's describing, like, the deserts and the landscapes, uh, he sometimes does use almost too many adjectives. He, he always likes to call the desert um, curry-coloured which I find kind of hilarious. But like one of the funny things about um, Dune is that the descriptions of the characters are very sparse a lot of the time. Like, th th there are like major characters in Dune who barely get any description of what they look like. And sometimes the descriptions that they do get are quite similar. Like, there's a lot of people who are just sort of like tall and like powerful features with like a strong brow and a commanding voice. The number of people in in June, who were described as having a commanding voice. And a lot of the women are just described as, like, being, like, beautiful, just sort of generically beautiful, and that's kind of it. Um, so, I, so I would think Frank is, is guilty of not having enough description, if anything. I mean, I mean, I mean my favorite example of that is um, Chani, who is, like, you know, one of the most significant characters, certainly most significant female characters in, like, the, the in, in Dune. Um... It, it, it's only mentioned in book three that Chani has red hair. Cha Chani is a Ranga. Chani, played by Zendaya in uh, the Dune movie, is a redhead. And Frank Herbert only bothers to mention that three books in. <laughs> like, what? Uh, you're not giving us, like, like it, that kind of description of what someone looks like at all for that, for that long? So, yeah, Frank is not very interested in describing people. He's a little bit more interested in, like, environments. But yeah, whatever, whatever. The point is, I don't think that either George or Frank are guilty of using too many adjectives. I think sometimes George Martin could be accused of using too many, but I don't, I'm, I'm not going to ding him. So both of our authors are on zero points so far. They are both equal. It's neck and neck. Okay. Number three. The third writing mistake is to start your novel at least three chapters before the first significant event of the plot. So sometimes there's a whole bunch of, like, pointless lead-up before anything important actually happens. Um, I feel like you could... you could argue that with George Martin. I mean, there's the prologue of A Song of Ice and Fire where uh, the Night's Watch encounter the White Walkers. Um, but, it, but, you know, if you ignore that... It, it's sort of a while before anything really important happens. I mean, like, you know, John Aaron dies and Ned becomes Hand of the King, but that's, like, not the most immediately significant thing. And, you know, Bran gets pushed from the tower by the Lannisters and breaks his back. But that's, like, a fair few chapters in. I mean, if we have a look, um, you know, the first chapter is The White Walkers. With Bran, there's, like, the execution of uh, Garrod or of Will. I always get confused between the show and the book there. And then, like, yeah, Catelyn's first chapter, and Jon Arryn is dead. Uh, Daenerys' first chapter, like, she's gonna marry Khal Drogo. Ned's first chapter, Robert arrives. Jon's first chapter, there's, like, the feast, and, like, he's thinking about joining the Night's Watch. So, like, it, the start of A Game of Thrones is pretty slow. Um, so, once again, I... I feel like you could say that George Martin is guilty of of starting the novel chapters before the first significant event of the plot. But I mean, you know, you can't ignore the prologue where there's the White Walkers, you know, killing people right at the very start, you know. Um, and, you know, Ned and John Aaron. Yeah, so I'm not going to ding George Martin there, but he's kind of close. He's kind of close to starting his novel before the first significant events. Uh, I, I mean, if we if we think beyond the first Song of Ice and Fire book, if we start thinking about, like, Clash or Dance... I, I mean, A Clash of Kings is similar. Like the, like, the Clash of Kings prologue is amazing. One of my favourite chapters in A Song of Ice and Fire, which they didn't really put properly in the book, but it's... in the show, but it's when um, Crescent tries to kill Melisandre. Um, but Melisandre kills Crescent. Is well, no, yeah, they kind of did do that in the show. Um, they just didn't have um, Patchface, which was disappointing. Um, what's my point? My point is that in A Clash of Kings, similar to um, A Game of Thrones, you know, th there is like a dramatic, uh, impactful prologue 
And then there's sort of a slower chapter from like the other characters when you go like, ah, oh, you're traveling with Yorin, and then like Sansa in King's Landing, and then like Tyrion arriving at King's Landing. Like it's quite slow after that initial prologue. Um, George Martin's writing sort of gets more and more ponderous as the A Song of Ice and Fire series goes on. Um, like Feast and Dance are widely criticized for being uh, just absurdly slow before anything actually happens. Um, so, you know, you could maybe argue that that George is guilty of this. And, and, and sort of similar with Frank. I, I mean, like, in Chapter 1 of Dune, uh, we have the Gomjabar test, uh, where the witch, Gaius Helen Mahayam, subjects Paul to this deadly test, uh, and he learns that he might be the Kwisatz Haderach, the, the chosen one, and, like, you know, the Atreides are moving to Arrakis. There is quite a lot of important stuff happening right in the first chapter of Dune. The subsequent chapters are slow. Um, like, there's a lot of sort of set up and build up, and, like, we learn a lot about each of the characters gradually and the world gradually. Um, Frank Herbert, I, I, I always find it so funny. Frank Herbert described the pacing of the first Dune book as having a coital rhythm, meaning it has the pace of sex. It starts slowly, and it gradually builds up tension until there is a sudden climactic release at the end of the story, and then it abruptly stops. That is how Frank Herbert has described the pacing of Dune, uh, which I find very funny. And, and it's relevant in terms of like that slow build-up, because Dune is quite slow at the start, until all of a sudden, like uh, halfway through, the, um, the Atreides get attacked by the Harkonnens, and everything goes tits up. Um, so, you know, you, you could maybe try and accuse Frank of starting the novel too early, making things happen too slowly. Um, but I think for both George Martin and Frank Herbert, like, it is purposeful, the slow build-up of tension, getting to know the characters, getting to know the world before anything happens. Um, and they both, uh, use, like, a, a powerful, eventful first chapter or prologue when like the white walkers appear in a song of ice and fire and the gom jabbar and the and the quizettes haderach and and, and gaius mahayam in dune so I, i'm not going to ding either of them so they're they're both they're, they're they're doing pretty well now they're both for three for three they have not been dinged for bad writing yet but let's see uh number four don't worry about tenses so there's like when you fuck up your tense and you use the present tense and you used the past tense and you will use the future tense and you and you switch up your tenses all over the place. I, I, I don't think Frank or George are guilty of this. Uh, they get their tenses straight. Uh, number five, not using the word said and instead using things like unveiled and proclaimed and conversed and vocalized and, you know, using every word that means said other than said. I don't think... I, I, I don't think... Frank or George are particularly guilty of that. Um, I mean, you know, Paul's mother answered. Gaius Mahayam wheezed. She chuckled. But then we've got a said there. I, I mean, the funny thing about Dune is that there isn't a huge amount of dialogue in Dune. Like, there's an, there's an enormous amount of internal monologue in Dune, which is why it's, like, impossible to adapt it to TV. Like, look at all of the, look at all this weird fucking internal monologue that's going on in Paul's consciousness. Like, that's what a lot of Dune is like, just these weird monologues. Um, so, you know, yeah, here's a said, here's a said, here's a said. I, we, we can't ding Frank Herbert for not using said. Um, what about George Martin? I, I, I don't think George Martin is particularly guilty of... I mean, you're right, Garrod urged. Weimar Royce asked. He, but he said... He, Royce asked, Garrod said. They, they say said. They're not afraid of saying said. Frank or George. So we're not going to ding them yet. They're doing pretty good. Five for five. Neither of them, neither of them have been dinged for bad writing yet. But they will be. Trust me, they will be. Number six, write with half an eye on the market. So this is like, you know, 
writing within particular like sort of genres or with particular tropes that are popular at the time so uh, the example by joel stickley here is the dark knight academy for witches wizards troubled vampires and tragically abused children so just you know so you know vampires are popular because of twilight or wizards are popular because of harry potter writing to like try and appeal to those particular tropes now i think that george martin and frank herbert are are very um innocent of both of these um like george martin i think was told that you know people aren't interested in like epic fantasy at the time um but he did it anyway and now epic fantasy is what's popular right now because of game of thrones so so george was a trend setter not a trend follower there is my understanding um and frank herbert could certainly not be said to be guilty of um chasing tropes i mean he was riding in um the 60s i mean i guess there was like other comparable I mean, I mean like dune has been compared to like foundation in terms of like the epic cerebral sci-fi sort of stuff but it's not like frank herbert was trying to make something that's very appealing to everyone dune is kind of hard to get into publishers were knocking back dune um dune was originally published by a publisher that is most notable previously for publishing automotive manuals uh, Frank had a lot of difficulty getting published. Um, so I don't think George or Frank were chasing trends. Uh, misusing apostrophes. Um, I don't think Frank or George misuse apostrophes. I, I would say that, that Muad'Dib, uh, which is like the messianic name of Paul Atreides among the Fremen, uh, I think you could... Uh, yeah, Muad'Dib with the apostrophe there. Muad'Dib, Muad'Dib. Um... You could say that that's a misuse of an apostrophe. Actually, and you know, and you know what else is the name Faradun? Uh, the, the, there's a character in book three, uh, and I I won't spoil you, but there is a character in book three um, called Faradun. Faradun, yeah, um, F A R A D apostrophe N. That 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 is a misuse of an apostrophe, if ever I've seen one. I mean, I guess this is sort of a different trope to what uh, Joel Stickley is talking about. Joel Stickley is talking about, like, uh, like just grammatically incorrect uses of apostrophes, like putting apostrophes in front of every S. Um, but there's also a sort of different apostrophe trope of just, like, fantasy languages, like elvish words in fantasy books, or is it full of apostrophes? Um, and, and and Frank Herbert is doing this. He's doing this with Faradun. He he does it with Muad'Dib. Uh, you know, I I'm gonna ding him. I'm go I think he I think he is guilty of misusing apostrophes, and we're gonna give Frank Herbert one point on his bad writer score. Frank Herbert has pulled ahead as being the worst writer in our in our scientific test of who is the worst writer. Because uh, Muad'Dib, uh, Faradun, I think there's probably some other examples in June as well. What do you guys think in the chat? Do you think this is just um, made up names? Uh, Jackie C says she, sorry, now says they never knew how to pronounce Faradun. What could it be other than Faradun? Could it be Faradon, Faradine? I, I feel like Faradun is correct. Um, 129 says that's common in Arabic though when you take it from Abjad to the Latin. Oh, okay, is that actually like consistent with with his borrowings from Arabic? Uh, Dothraki words and Valyrian. I don't think there's a lot of weird apostrophes in Dothraki and Valyrian. Thanks for the super chat from Hot Creamy Fart, by the way, who says that Pratchett outshines both these fools. It would be very fun to do some like Discworld talk on on uh, on Alt Shift X. That's true. Um, names don't count, says Altakut. I wouldn't knock either. I think it shouldn't count for made-up names. You guys think it's a bit much? You think it's a reference to Arabic? All right, okay. I've heard the people. You guys think that it's legit, Frank, Frank Herbert's use of apostrophes? I rescind the point. We're being scientific here. It's important that we get it correct. Yeah, he's imitating Islamic. All right, done. They're both on zero. They're both have perfect scores, but the day is yet young. <laughs> and, and, and I think that someone's about to get dinged in this one, because number eight 
is create unlikely love interests. Hmm. Which of these authors is guilty of creating unlikely love interests? Love interests, perhaps, say, a brother and sister, Jamie and Cersei Lannister? Um, in, in the notorious 1993 early outline of A Song of Ice and Fire, George Martin originally planned to have Jon Snow have a romantic entanglement with his half-sister, Arya Stark. And Tyrion also would have a crush on Arya, creating a love triangle. Um, that's fucked up. There are all sorts of unlikely and uncomfortable love interests in A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, there's an awful lot of incest. I mean, Aegon with Visenya and, and Rhaenys. Um, I, I am gonna ding George for unlikely love interests. Um, the, the examples that Joel Stickley gives here is like a theologian falling in love with a, with a clown. Um, the short, Alfonso, the shortest clown in all of France. Uh, it's quite a funny example by Joel Stickley. Um, but I think that George absolutely is guilty of this. Frank, meanwhile, I mean, you know, and also like, you know, John and Ygritte is like a star-crossed love, you know, John the the northerner and Yeager at the wildling. That one is more forgivable to me because, you know, there's a very, you know, there's a real sort of narrative purpose that feels sort of believable. But all of the bloody incest in A Song of Ice and Fire, um, I'm going to call that. He, he's guilty of unlikely love interests. Um, or un unwholesome, at least. Frank Herbert, like, there's not a whole lot of love in Dune. I mean, there's some. I mean, there's Paul and Shani and, like, um, sh uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, I won't spoil the later Dune books, but there are some, there are some other relationships of note in the later Dune books, which you could say are pretty unlikely, and I think if you've read Dune Messiah or, or God Emperor of Dune, you know what I'm talking about. There are some unlikely love interests going on there. Um, but... I'm not going to ding Frank for this. Like, I don't think the love affairs in uh, Dune feel, like, forced or artificial, you know? Like, there is... They feel natural, they feel possible, and they are unusual, but but they're not as fucked up and crazy as, as George R. R. Martin's constant, like, you know, secret love affairs and incests and stuff, which feel like they're really sort of shoved in there, you know? Uh, what do you guys think? Um... Euron in the live chat points out that incest was a thing in medieval England, but twin incest? Yeah, he's not he's not just doing like aristocratic cousins marrying cousins and uncles and things like that. He's he is putting secret brother sister love affairs in every bloody at every possibility. Um Yeah, there there there, there are some things that go on in June that are a bit weird, but I'm not going to I'm not going to say they're I'm not going to ding um, Frank Herbert for it. Um, Rod Rock Drigo says, the point of the incest is to be uncomfortable. It's probably not going to end well. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I mean, like, to some extent, George Martin's weird romantic relationships are, like, purposeful. Um, like, Jamie and Cersei's relationship is partly about their narcissism. Uh, it's about their selfishness. It's about the sort of corruption of the whole political system, like, and, and the fragility of the whole political system. Um, and Fado Cado points out that, yeah, like, this is based on the War of the Roses, real historical events. But, like, I think it would be fine if George Martin had one incestuous brother-sister relationship, but there are incestuous relationships throughout The Song of Ice and Fire, especially in, like, the Targaryen history. Um for the for the sake of like salaciousness and ridiculousness um to 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 the point where i think it gets silly um fujisaw says that if brienne and jamie get together that'll be an unlikely one yeah but that'll feel earned you know because brienne and jamie have been through so much together and that sort of makes sense for jamie's character Thanks for the super chat from Andrew, who says, Game of Thrones has 3D characters, but doesn't come close to capturing the same sublime weirdness to his world than Herbert does. Herbert's monsters are more original, and he's more out there surreal. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's true. I, I think that you could say, I think you could definitely say that Frank Herbert is more original than um, George Martin. I mean, I mean, Frank was writing uh, a solid, you know, 30 years before George Martin was. Um, and he has ideas that, that are just so crazy and interesting, like the things that 
go on with, you know, Alia in in the later books and, um, you know, later the second. And, you know, again, I'm not going to drop any huge spoilers for the later Dune books, but Frank, Frank has a huge imagination. And I think that, you know, it's the fact that Frank's writing is driven by these philosophical ideas that he's fascinated by in terms of self-development, power, religion, environment. Um, I think it's those ideas that is driving his wild originality because I think that I think that the philosophical themes come first and the story and the characters sort of come second in Frank Herbert's writing. I mean, he has said as much that his characters are something that he sort of writes. But like I, 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 I was reading an interview where he was saying that, like, you know, he comes up with the ideas first and then he's like, oh, I need characters for these things to happen to, <laughs> you know, Um Whereas George, I think, is more oriented towards characters first. I think George is more interested in what, you know, what if there was this dwarf who had a terrible relationship with his father and who felt resented and unloved and what would that be like for that character? Like, George really starts with, you know, John the bastard and, you know, Arya, the girl who doesn't fit into the in, into the world that she's born into. Uh, George is very, like, character first, whereas Frank, I think, is very ideas first. Um, Paul and Shani fall in love off page, MF Pope says. Yeah, I, I, you can definitely criticize Frank Herbert's writing of romance. Um, because we get very little, like, actual romantic scenes or romantic moments. We, we learn very little about how these relationships start and, like, what, you know, what the feelings really are. Like, like Frank Herbert is not, he doesn't write romance into his books really he just sort of says oh yeah these two are forget these two are, are, are together now um and that's true of the relationships in the third june book and and the later books they just sort of happen and it's like oh okay um so you know that that is something that frank herbert is guilty of i think but um but in terms of number eight the crime of creating unlikely love interests we're gonna ding george for that uh and then we're gonna move on to number nine mixing your metaphors um, so this is basically just using like metaphors and analogies that are piled on piled on top of each other like a Jenga tower, like building up so many metaphors like a tower of Jenga that the whole thing is just unstable and it collapses onto the ground like an avalanche of Jenga, a Jenga avalanche of metaphors, and then it, and then someone slips on the table like a banana peel. They they slip off the Jenga piece like a banana peel, and, and then they fall down like the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the, in the, in the 17th century. That's, that's what we're talking about, mixing metaphors. Um, and I, uh, I don't think that George or Frank are particularly guilty of mixing metaphors. I mean, Frank Herbert uses... Uh, well, I, Frank Herbert does use some weird metaphors. Um, specifically, Frank Herbert, when he describes Paul's prescience... Paul's ability to, like, see the future. Um, Frank often talks about Paul's prescience in terms of, like, an ocean. Um, and he talks about it in terms of, like, rising and falling ocean waves, where, like, sometimes you're up the top of an ocean wave and you can see the future in the past, and sometimes you dip down, like, in between the waves and, and you can't see as far. Um... But then Frank sometimes mixes his metaphors and talks about time in it, 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 the, the vision in terms of like something that like solidifies in in the present, like narrows down like a narrow doorway. Um, and ma maybe we can pull some of that up actually. Um, might be a little tricky to find. I mean, if, if we go to the scene where like uh, Paul first gets like his oh uh, well, yeah he, i mean here's an example a description of paul's um prescience you know it's it's like sight where you know you can't see without light so if you're at the floor of a valley you cannot see beyond the valley just so muadib could not always choose to look across the mysterious terrain so here we're using a metaphor of like uh, prophetic sight is like looking over a landscape um but then we have a different metaphor where time is broad, but when you pass through it, time becomes a narrow door. Yeah, that's like exactly what I was saying before. Um, yeah, and here we're using like the landscape thing, the time area surrounded them, but the here and now existed as a place of mystery. So again, we're using the metaphor of like, um, we're using the metaphor of 
a landscape for prescient time. But there is also some description. Here we are. So now time is like an ocean. The steadiness of time's movement everywhere, complicated by shifting currents, waves, surges, countersurges, like surf against rocky cliffs. A new understand of his prescience, the source of blind time. Sensation of fear. Prescience was an illumination that incorporated the limits of what it revealed. A source of accuracy and error. A Heisenberg indeterminacy intervened. The expenditure of energy that revealed what he saw, changed what he saw. The time nexus was a boiling of possibilities, focused here, where the most minute action moved a gigantic lever across the known universe, the slightest movement creating vast shiftings in the pattern. So he, he does use a variety of different metaphors to describe Paul's prescience, but he's not mixing those metaphors. Like, he, sometimes he uses the landscape metaphor, sometimes he uses the water metaphor, but it's not like he's mixing them together in a way that's confusing and ridiculous, right? So I don't think we can ding Frank for mixing metaphors. I think sometimes he gets close. Um, like, he does use all sorts of arcane metaphors to describe the, you know, the, the trinocular vision that permitted him to see time become space. You can see why this stuff is hard to adapt into a movie, right? Like, this is honestly how, like, half of the Dune books go. Like, it's all just this internal monologue, thoughts, description of visions, and, like... Like, there are entire chapters, and, and this is not a spoiler, but, like, in the third Dune book... There's a solid, like, three chapters almost in a row, all describing one long drug trip. Like, a character just has a massive drug trip. And there's, like, three chapters describing him just lying on the floor, going like, I can see into infinity, man! And it's just like, wow! And it's just, like, staring at a kaleidoscope on shrooms for, like, three chapters. Um, but... We're talking about mixing metaphors, and I don't think Frank is guilty of it. I don't think George Martin is guilty of it either. I mean, I mean, I mean, something that always comes to mind for me with George is what what, what was um what was that bit in like a Clash of Kings when uh, there's like the black dragon of smoke that emerges from the burning ruins of Winterfell. Um, where is that bit? It's in... It, it's when, like, Bran... Bran and, and, and Mira and Osher and Jojen and Hodor leave... No, no, it, it's when he's, like, seeing through Summer's eyes, and, like, Bran through Summer's eyes sees the burning Winterfell, and he sees, like, a, a smoke dragon emerge from the ruins of Winterfell, and he's like, oh my god, it's a dragon, but also, like, it's not a dragon, it's just the smoke coming off Winterfell. Um, and I think the reason for the confusion is that we're seeing that through Summer's eyes, and so we're seeing a direwolf's understanding of what smoke is, and, like... You know, also, like, there's a lot of interesting, like, when the Starks are walking into direwolves, like, we get descriptions of what direwolves think men are and how they understand, like, swords are like metal claws, like a wolf would have, you know, and, like, armor is, like, is, like, steel skin and stuff. So, so there's sort of some weird metaphors going on there, but it sort of makes sense in the context of, like, a wolf's perception of the world, you know? So... I, you know, I think that for, Frank do, uh, George does use some weird metaphors at times, but I don't think either of these authors are particularly guilty of mixing their metaphors in confusing ways. Number 10. Cast children's stories exclusively with orphans. So this is like, you know, a lot of like young adult fiction, you know, like Harry Potter um, and whatever. Katniss Everdeen, is she an orphan? Um, there's a lot of, like, YA lit that has orphans. Their parents are dead. Because it's much easier to have your young protagonist go on dangerous adventures if they don't have parents to tell them not to. Um, and I think you could ding George Martin for this. Uh, because the Stark kids become orphans when Ned Stark dies and Catelyn Stark dies. Um, so... And, and Jon Snow is an orphan. 
because uh, his mom is dead and Daenerys is an orphan. I mean, Daenerys is probably the strongest example because Ares and uh, Rhaella die before the start of the story. Um, I think you could ding George Martin for having lots of orphans in his in his thing. Um, whereas that's not true of Dune in the same way. Um, yeah, I, th I think we should ding George for this. He has a lot of orphans in his stories, including Daenerys, who I think is like a really obvious example of it. Uh, what do you guys think? Um, I mean, Lightning says that, you know, the Starks being orphaned is earned by the story. Yeah, that's true. I mean, like, it doesn't happen immediately. Um, and it is sort of meaningful. It is earned. Uh, it happens after a book or two. But yeah, you guys agree that, that Daenerys... Um, is guilty. Thanks for the super chat from my age. Puts their money on Herbert. Um, Sir Unfunny thinks that having orphans is not bad in general. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 specifically, I, I think, when there's like too many of them. Yeah, Theon is not an orphan. Um, Ash brings up Children of Dune, the third Dune book. That's a little complicated. I, I'm not going to go spoiling Children of Dune, but I, 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 I would say that it's complicated, the, the orphanage situation there. Um, but, but yeah, you could make an argument that Frank is guilty of this. But, it, but it's not, you know... Well, yeah, no, you could... Uh... Yeah, because, I mean, the whole... Um... There, there is, there is orphaning happening in the third Dune book, but, but I don't, I don't think that it's as bad as like George Martin with Daenerys. Um, I mean, Tyrion is not orphaned. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people dying in childbirth in A Song of Ice and Fire. I think that George Martin is mostly killing mothers with that, though. Like, there are a lot of characters who have fathers, but not mothers in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, Stephen says that, you know, the overall sheer numbers of death <laughs> in A Song of Ice and Fire guarantees thousands of orphans. Yeah, that's true. Um, Varys' little birds. Yeah, there are a lot of orphans. Miguel says that the Fremen are like the lost children from Peter Pan. Ooh. There is a certain certain uh, longevity aspect going on there. That's an interesting perspective. R plus L equals J is so central. Hot pie is an orphan. Yeah, th there are there are a bunch of orphans. Um, I, I agree with you guys. That I, I think the Starks being orphans, it is earned by the story and it happens sort of later on. And Daenerys is a strong example of another orphan. Um, but... I mean, I mean, Ned Stark is a... <laughs> is an orphan. Catelyn still has a father. I, I think we, we won't ding either of the authors. I think you can make a, an argument for George having a few, like, using that trope of, like, orphaned heroes. Uh, and th there is a bit of that in uh, the third Dune book, but let's... I, I, I think that they can both get past this one. No number 11. Having everything happen suddenly. Um, so this is, like, a lot of, like, really climactic events happening all at once. Um, you know, deaths and changes. And, um, I think we can, I think we can ding Frank Herbert for this. Because, like, Dune, you know, as we said, uh, Frank Herbert described Dune as having a coital rhythm where it's slow and not, not much happens and it builds up, builds up, builds up, then everything happens all of a sudden at the end. Um, now, spoilers for the end of the first Dune book. So, spoiler warning for the end of the first book of Dune. But in the final chapter, you have Paul, like, taking over the planet, threatening to destroy all of the spice, uh, betrothing himself to marry the Emperor's daughter, Irulan, defeating Fate Ralpha in mortal combat, declaring himself the Emperor of the Universe, laying out his, like, plan on how he's going to manage Dune... Uh, it comes to a conclusion about his prescient visions to avert the jihad. The last chapter of Dune is very eventful. 
everything happens suddenly. And Frank Herbert has, like, said this uh, about the end of June. Like, like it all happens suddenly and then it just ends. And, and, like, we don't get to see the aftermath of the climax of June in Dune. It, it, there's sort of four more books that, that, like, continue exploring what the fuck just happened. Um, so I, I think we can ding Frank Herbert for this. I think Frank Herbert is guilty of having everything happen suddenly at the end of June. Um, you could almost, like, ding him for this during, like, the, you know, the Harkonnen attack on the Atreides and, you know, Leto's death and Yui's death and all that stuff that sort of happens at once. Like, like, there, like, June has long periods of nothing happening and then very short moments of everything happening. Um, so... Yeah, I, I feel pretty confident in digging Frank Herbert for that. Uh, George Martin, I mean, I guess the Red Wedding is a moment when a lot of things happen. Um, but, you know, I, I think for the most part, he, George's stories are fairly evenly paced with, you know, climactic moments happening. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, towards the end of each book, there is a lot going on. Um, but I don't think it's anything like the end of June book one. So I think that Frank gets a point there and George Martin does not. What do you guys think in the chat? Uh, Edgar says uh, that they agree. Seems like Herbert was running out of paper to write on. <laughs> yeah. Well, he. I, I almost wonder if it was related to like the serialization of June. Like a lot of books back in the day were published chapter by chapter as opposed to like as an entire finished novel. And you almost wonder if the... Um, if the publish the publication history and the publication structure of June might have contributed to the sort of weird pacing. Um, Ashley says George Martin has a lot of good foreshadowing and build up. Uh, yeah, I think you guys, I think you guys agree that June is uh, very sudden. And Connor points out that the end of June Messiah is also much the same. Yeah, I completely agree, Connor. The end of the second June book, and we won't spoil what happens. But it's a very, it is quite similar to June 1, uh, even more extreme, where there's a lot of, like, setup and build-up and, like, thinking and, like, new characters getting introduced, but those characters don't really do anything. It, 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 and then at the end of book two, and I won't spoil it, but at the end, at the end of book two, all of the characters all go to one place and all of the things happen and all of the plot lines are just all resolved at once and it's like what and it's and it's over in a very similar way to june one uh and then you're just like what the fuck and then you got to read the next book to find out what any of that like meant um so yes i think frank is 100 percent guilty of this particular writing mistake um <laughs> Uh, number 12 the 12th writing mistake is presenting your research in the form of dialogue frank herbert is so guilty of this oh my god um he like he has all of these theories like th th there's a there's a ch there's a chapter in book 4 god emperor of june and I, and I won't spoil the context but there's like this really long and weird conversation about homosexuality that happens in dune book 4 where, like, Frank just presents his theory of why people are gay and, like, what that says about society and what that, like, means for, like, politics and sociology. And it's it just feels so, like, weird and out of context. And it's like, why why is Frank telling us about his views on... His, like, his, like theory on homosexuality? Like, like, Frank... I mean, you know, Frank comes from an age before the internet when smart people, the only way they could be exposed to ideas or, or you know, or one of the more influential ways to learn about ideas was just like, to, there was a limit, there was reduced access to like ideas and reading books was one of like the only ways to get those kinds of ideas and essays and, and newspapers and printed books. And you can really narrow down, like there's like a bibliography of like 10 or 20 non-fiction books which were a huge influence on frank herbert um certain ideas about like jungian psychology and like buddhism and uh ev evolutionary psychology um and you can really see the influence of those books and, and like lawrence of arabia there's like a particular book about lawrence of arabia that was like enormously 
influential on Frank's conception of like the Fremen and like Paul's relationship with the Fremen. Um, and you can really see the way that Frank's reading uh, and his research just is presented in his novels almost like verbatim like almost like he's just saying hey there's my idea and and you know ecology is i, I mean if, uh, for an example in the first june book if, if we look at uh Kainz's death scene so this is something that happens halfway through the first june book this is something that was in the june movie when Kainz is dying in the desert uh and Kainz is a man in um Kainz is a man in the first book and has quite a different death in the first Dune book compared to in the Dune movie that just came out. Uh, basically, Kynes dies slowly alone in the desert, and it's this really interesting uh, chapter where sort of the point is that Kynes is a scientist who thought he could control and change the environment through his scientific knowledge, um, but uh, he gets killed by that environment. And all of his scientific knowledge uh, is not enough to save him. And so it's sort of a statement of, like, it's a statement on, like, the hubris and the arrogance of, like, man trying to control the environment when the environment is something greater and more powerful than any one of us. And, of course, Dune overall is is all about, like, um, you know, the, in, in the first sort of Dune trilogy of three books, it's about uh, people trying to change the environment and the consequences of that and the unforeseen consequences of fucking with the environment um, and these were ideas that Frank was personally very passionate about. Frank was very interested in sustainable energy, um, and he personally, like, built and invented machines that used energy uh, in sustainable ways, and, um, the, the, you know, there's a lot of description in the Dune books of, like, how the Fremen use water, um, and I mean, and, and fundamentally, like, the inspiration for the book Dune came from when Frank Herbert was researching sand dunes in Oregon, uh, for his his journalistic career and he was learning about how dunes move like ocean waves but slower and the fluid dynamics works the same way and and, and like you know this non-fictional research that frank was doing appears in dune like <laughs> like word for word he's just describing here's something i learned about this and you know he, the things that he learned about uh zen buddhism being just like presented as the ideas of the bene gesserit and things that he learned about like uh, desert peoples and like messiah religion so frank is absolutely guilty of like presenting his like research his like non-fictional knowledge and ideas and interests and just putting them in the book and, and that's like all of book four <laughs> like like god emperor of dune very large chunks of that book is just the titular character of god emperor of dune just sitting back and saying here's my theory about uh rebellion and autocracy here's my theory about the gays here's my theory about why soldiers should be women here's my like that's like very large chunks of god emperor are just the, the titular character just holding court and just describing the way things are according to frank herbert's research so frank herbert is absolutely guilty of that um george martin presenting research in the form of dialogue i mean you know like you can see how george's interests in like the war of the roses and medieval history is absolutely a huge influence on a song of ice and fire um but nowhere near to the extent of frank like like george doesn't just like sit down and present like you know here's the theory here's this historical story and here it is just laid out in the dialogue like george doesn't really do that he is taking heavy inspiration from medieval history um and you know from lovecraft there's some very like direct like lovecraft influences in a song of ice and fire's world building but I, he doesn't present his research in the form of dialogue like frank does so frank has pulled ahead frank has pulled ahead we've got george martin has one bad writing point um for his unlikely romances all of his various uh, weird incest relationships uh frank herbert has one point for having everything happen suddenly and one point for presenting his research okay number number 13 commit to your genre so this is basically like relying too much on genre tropes so in his book 100 ways to write badly well joel stickley's example is 
Captain Dash Gallant engaged the space drive and accelerated into the darkness of the Cloud Nebula. His destination was Mysterion 4, the uncharted planet, which, as space legend had it, was home to the quasi-mythical race of psychic aliens known as the Clavoyates. Now, that paragraph, it almost sounds like some of George Martin's Thousand World books. <laughs> jo George Martin, uh, did a lot of science fiction writing before he wrote A Song of Ice and Fire. And some of it is very sort of tropey and goofy. I mean, it also is quite, you know, unique and George Martinian and, you know, like romantic and longing and dark. And, you know, like he, he has his own uh, vibe and his own spin on it. Um, in terms of A Song of Ice and Fire, I mean, like there absolutely are parts of A Song of Ice and Fire that really indulge in the glinting of the light on the on the shields and the armor and the banners that were flapping in the wind and the crimson and the gold and the boo -doo -doo -doo. Um, but George Martin is also deeply interested in uh, subverting and questioning and complicating fantasy tropes almost too much, you know, like George Martin. Like, like, George Martin said that A Song of Ice and Fire is, in some ways, a response to The Lord of the Rings. And it's about questioning the tropes and the assumptions of that genre. So, so I, I, I don't think that George commits to his genre over much. I think that George is very interested in questioning his genre. And he also sort of mixes genres. Like, like George has a lot of horror elements in, like, everything the Boltons do. And uh, Euron Greyjoy and the Drowned God, and he's got a sort of a mythic quality, but he's also got like a, a Lovecraftian cosmic horror, sort of, you know, the Black Stone, and there's also some science fictional elements. Um, Preston Jacobs, the YouTuber, has made a lot of hay by pointing out the science fictional ideas in A Song of Ice and Fire in terms of like skin changing telepathy um, and like psychic, you know, influences and possession. And, and, and you know, like I, I think that a lot of George Martin's sci-fi is sort of bleeding into his fantasy. So my point is that I think that George actually sort of subverts and combines and plays with the genre in some creative and thoughtful ways. So I don't think he's guilty of like uncritically embracing the cliches of the genre in the ways that uh, Joel Stickley is talking about here. Uh, what about Frank Herbert? Like Frank Herbert is also very interested in playing with genre. Like Frank Herbert um, does some weird things with genre. Like, you know, he has this science fiction world where there's spaceships and laser guns. Uh, but also there's no technology and there's no robots and the whole philosophy of Dune is kind of uh, against the cliches of science fiction. Like Frank Herbert has talked about how he hates this idea that technology will solve all our problems and this idea that science will solve all of our problems. He, he, he was someone who was interested in using technology and he was interested in science, but he did not believe that we should... Uh, overuse technology without thinking about the consequences. Um, and so Dune does does subvert genre and it also sort of mixes and matches genres. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, it, I mean, Dune often reads like a philosophical treatise more than it reads like a science fiction story. Um, I think that Dune is unique in a lot of ways, stylistically, and in terms of genre and how it's written. So I, I, I don't think that Frank or George are guilty of overly committing to their genre. Number 14, bad writing mistake, failing to contextualize dialogue. So basically when there's, when there's long strings of dialogue uh, where it doesn't identify who's saying what, and it very quickly becomes just confusing. Um, George Martin is not guilty of that. Well, George Martin is sometimes kind of guilty of that. There, like, there are some, like, council room scenes where sometimes, like, you know, the king and, and the small council, you know, Tywin and Cersei and Harris Swift and, uh, and and all the small council, you know, like Ned and Renly and Barristan and Robin, like, you know, whoever's on the small council are all sitting together. Sometimes there's a lot of different people talking at once. Uh, but I think, that, I think George usually does contextualize, whereas... Frank, like, like, like with Frank, there are some long dialogue scenes, and Frank does not always deign to make it clear who's talking to who. Um, I mean, he, here's Yui talking to Jessica. Um, you know, she said, he said, 
he said i mean i guess it's more obvious here because uh yui and jessica are of different genders so it's sort of easy to indicate he said she said um it, well i think one of the reasons why june can be confusing is that the dialogue is often interspersed with internal thoughts um and sometimes the thoughts sort of like break up the structure of the dialogue in a way that makes it confusing um so here's paul talking to leto so you know leto says this paul says that leto says that paul says that you know like frank is interspersing the duke said and paul said i i, I think there are some examples where frank frank's dialogue does become a bit confusing i mean here through fear comes in and he starts talking and so yeah the, you know I, I think there are some examples where frank herbert's dialogue is a little bit ambiguous but i don't, I don't think we can quite d ding him for for doing this too much and yeah george martin i think is even more clear so i i, I don't think we can blame frank or george for failing to contextualize dialogue what do you guys think in the live chat um steven says there are a few times where they just don't shut up in the dialogue yeah that's true and yeah like we were saying george does george does sometimes have like large conversations with a lot of people in the room um G uh, june frank frank's june conversations tend to have fewer people in them which sort of makes it easier to see um John says there's no robots in June. The Butlerian Jihad was a war against robots. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's my point. Like, the point of the Butlerian Jihad is that it removes robots and computers and AI from the story of uh, June. Um, Golomuk says that George chides Tolkien for good versus evil, but then we have evil ice zombies versus the world. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, some... Song of Ice and Fire readers expect that the White Walkers might actually be a little bit more morally complicated than just being evil. Um, you also could argue that the White Walkers are more like a natural force. They're more like the climate. They're more like just a, a reality of the world than an actual evil, you know? Maybe the White Walkers are amoral as opposed to evil. Um, but, you know, the story isn't over, so it's really hard to make a judgment about what the White Walkers really mean when, in the books, we basically don't know shit about them. Um, Alyssa says that almost 100% of God Emperor is confusing dialogue. I mean, it's normally just, like, one or two people um, in God Emperor, I feel. Like, it certainly is confusing, but I, I don't think it's confusing in terms of n knowing who's saying what. At least that's my impression. Um... John says they're both the same with this category. I feel like Frank is a little bit more... Uh, Frank really enjoys writing stuff like a preacher talking to a mass than two people talking. Yeah, I, I mean, you can definitely criticize Frank Herbert's dialogue where, like... Like, like something that I've found, like, w when you're, like, quoting from Dune... Like, like, when you're quoting from, say, A Song of Ice and Fire, you write the quote and you write who said... which character said the quote. Because that context of which character said it matters in A Song of Ice and Fire. Whereas in Dune, it, it kind of doesn't matter who says what, because, like, the majority of the spoken dialogue in Dune is just sort of people explaining ideas that Frank Herbert finds interesting. And it kind of doesn't matter who says what. Um, like, sometimes, you know, like, like, half the characters in Dune are all, like, Bene Gesserit-trained, spice-enhanced, uh, super smart, thoughtful brainiac people um and they kind of all are just smart people who have smart ideas and it kind of doesn't matter who says what in dune a lot of the time um and, and yeah it does feel like a preacher talking to a mass in fact that is literally what happens in dune book three and i won't spoil it but like there is a character in dune book three who literally preaches to the masses and it and it just feels like frank is just telling us ideas is just holding court about his opinions um, so, yeah, inter internal monologue interrupts the flow. Yeah, I think that makes the dialogue confusing. Uh, Max says, what were the points against Herbert? Uh, we, we dinged Frank Herbert for presenting his research in the form of dialogue when he's just talking about ecology and politics all the time. And we dinged him for having everything happen suddenly, especially in the final chapter of Dune Book One. And at the end of his other books. Um, so failing to contextualize dialogue. Yeah, I, I don't think that... Like, I think that Frank Herbert is sometimes a bit guilty of that. 
Uh, sometimes his dialogue was a little confusing, but I don't I don't think it's enough to ding him, and I don't think George Martin is guilty of that either. Okay, here's another one. Here's a spicy one. Number fifteen, pick the wrong hero. So. Uh, again, we're drawing from the book 100 Ways to Write Badly Well by Joel Stickley. There's a link in the description if you'd like to check out his book because it's wonderful and we're using it as the structure for this video. So go check out Joel Stickley's book. Uh, and number 15 is picking the wrong hero. And, and Joel's idea here is basically if you have a protagonist who is just thoroughly unlikable, like he tells the story of a king who is just tyrannical and horrible and he's the main character. Does that remind you of anyone? <laughs> Uh, we won't spoil it, but like, you know, the titular character of the fourth Dune book, God Emperor of Dune, he's a God Emperor who, like in Joel Stickley's example here, is not a very likable character, I would say. And that is true of, uh, I, I, I think, a lot of the characters in the second and third Dune books as well. Um, I think there are, a lot of the characters of Dune are people who, like, wield power due to, like, some abstract philosophical plan a plan that is not even explained to the reader really um like, like, like dune book one is okay because paul is sort of new to this world paul is young paul is learning um whereas you know not to spoil it too much but in the later dune books like the characters are a lot more sort of confident and they say, no, I know what's going on and this is what's right for everyone else and I'm going to impose it on everyone else. And I find that quite dislikable. I mean, your your mileage may vary. Like, let me know what you think in the comments. But I find the protagonists of the later Dune books to be not very likable and not very nice. And, and you know, like, like Frank Herbert is sort of self-aware about that to, to a point because there are characters in God Emperor and in the other books who are you know, rebelling against um, the main power-wielding protagonists and so on. Um, so, you know, Frank, Frank is not, like, unaware of that. But, but but some of his heroes are really not heroes. And, and, and that is, I guess, part of the point. Like, 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 Frank Herbert said that the first three Dune books are about questioning the Messiah, questioning the whole idea of a hero. The whole point is that his heroes are unlikable and amoral and dangerous um so maybe we can let frank off the hook but like that doesn't detract from the fact that like sometimes you have to read from the point of view of someone who just is not likable and is not heroic and that kind of sucks sometimes um george martin I, I think you could argue that you know characters like theon like theon Greyjoy, is quite dislikable uh in book two um but I think that Theon, I mean, you know, I should speak for myself, Theon sort of won my sympathies later on. And the majority of the protagonists in A Song of Ice and Fire I find likable. Arya is very likable. Uh, I find Tyrion likable, even though Tyrion is uh, a terrible person in a lot of ways. Um, you can make the argument that Tyrion is a horrible, horrible person. Um, but I, I, he still wins my sympathies, you know? So I think George Martin is very good at making us like the heroes. And I think that's a huge part of what makes Song of Ice and Fire great, is the characters are just so engaging. Even Jamie Lannister, even Cersei Lannister, the, the, these murderous, incestuous tyrants, these horrible people are so likable, you know? And I guess that's kind of the point, you know? Like, like, like George is really fucking with our expectations and with genre and so, so, so you know, I, I know that some people don't like reading Jamie chapters and they don't like reading Theon chapters, but I think what makes Song of Ice and Fire great is that those characters become sympathetic and engaging, you know, because of how dislikable they are sometimes, you know? So I, I don't think we can blame George for this. But Frank, I feel like we can blame Frank for, like, having... Here, because like Frank has fewer protagonists than A Song of Ice and Fire. Frank has... June has fewer... POV characters, and a larger percentage of them, I think, are dislikable. Um, especially in Dune book 2, 3, and 4. What do you guys think in the live chat? Do you agree with me? Nick says that John is pretty heroic. Mark says that Cersei chapters are the best. I totally agree. Cersei chapters are so much fun. She is just a mess. She's just a whirlwind. She's just an alcoholic, spiteful scared, afraid, desperate, lovable B-word. Like, she is horrible, but so much fun, you know? 
So, like, I, I think that's kind of why some of George's characters work. Uh, John is heroic. It's hard to connect to a protagonist who's just, like, a really bad guy. Yeah, I, I like, I don't think many of... Um, I don't think many of George's Song of Ice and Fire's characters are just really bad people. I mean, Daenerys might go in that direction. Tyrion is increasingly going in that direction. But it's very earned, you know? And they really make us sympathize with the character before the character becomes evil. Um, uh, CW says, oh, you're saying God Emperor isn't likable, but Cersei is? You're going to have to define likable. I mean, like we were saying, I think Cersei is an enormous amount of fun. Like, she is a, a, a garbage fire who is just lashing out and, and she drops these, like, burns on characters, like, just talking smack about Harris Swift and Giles Rosby. And, like, the, the, there's just so, so much going on. Like, she is having... She's constantly jumping from one obsession to another, creating enemies, you know? Like, like she's, she's all over the place. Whereas, I, I think, for me, like, the God Emperor of Dune is less uh, sympathetic and likable because he's just sort of indulging him like he's just talking to hear himself talk and just laying out these dry theories and just being a dick to everyone but not really like explaining himself and not really like eh. uh, olivia says the victarian chapters are dislikable that's a great point victarian is a horrible character who was not in the game of thrones show but in the game of thrones books he is this iron-born viking who just murders people and rapes people and is just horrible and dumb and has very few <laughs> Um, very few, uh, good characteristics. And I think that is sort of fun in a way. I mean, you know, this is kind of subjective. Maybe it's just me, but personally, I enjoy the villainous protagonists of A Song of Ice and Fire a lot more than I... I, I mean, like, you just, you enjoy Dune for a different reason. Like, Dune, you don't read Dune for the characters, really. You read Dune for the ideas and the situations and the themes and the world. Um, it's, it's kind of apples and oranges, but I, I think I'm going to ding Frank and not George. I think that's what we're going to do. What are you guys saying? Uh, Haley says, you definitely don't connect or empathize with the Dune characters. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, only in the most abstract way. You know, I mean, like sometimes, you know, Paul's feelings with his prescience in terms of like feeling like he's trapped and feeling like he's not in control and feeling like he's got this weight of responsibility like you know there are feelings you can connect with but i agree it's it's difficult to emphasize with the dune characters because they are in such weird situations and i think that's increasingly true in the later dune books cersei cares about her family yeah I, I think that's why cersei is still lovable and relatable is that cersei's horrible and she does horrible things but she does them for very understandable reasons like she just wants to be loved she wants to get the approval of the ghost of her father she she's like stressed like everything that she's ever cared about is is slipping between her fingers she has been denied all her life like she feels like everything's been against her she's been denied power because of her gender she was married off to robert robert was this horrible abusive uh, rapist uh, husband um there's a lot of r emotional reasons why cersei is the way she is that we can connect with whereas the characters of the later dune books are like explicitly like they're not even human people in the normal sense like they are people who like have like the entire memories of all their ancestors and the vision of a thousand years like they are literally godlike in the later dune books and so like i it makes them less interesting as heroes it makes them more interesting for like thematic reasons and for plot reasons uh which is why dune is good and interesting but it's different for um it's different for dune as for a song of ice and fire um a fictional character being likable isn't the same as liking a real person. Absolutely. I would not want to spend time in a room with Cersei Lannister, uh, but I love reading about her. Um, God Emperor does struggle with the small remaining aspects of his humanity at times. That's true. Like, like there are some moments, well, quite a few moments in God Emperor where the God Emperor is really struggling with, uh, you know having to carry out this plan and losing his humanity and losing his body and losing what he was and being tempted by like normal human life so so there absolutely are some more empathetic moments um was king robert actually a rapist beyond just the context of an uncomfortable arranged noble marriage i robert was a rapist 
just within the context of an uncomfortable arranged noble marriage, to my understanding. Um, Drew says, I feel like George doesn't get your point that we care so much about A Song of Ice and Fire because of the characters. He wants to keep building a world, a la Herbert or Tolkien, but we are invested in the story more. I mean, if you're talking about George's actual publications in recent years, like, yeah, like, I am not as interested in the world of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood as I am in the characters of A Song of Ice and Fire. I, I'm so invested in the characters of A Song of Ice and Fire, and that's why I want The Winds of Winter. I don't really care about the world building in the world of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood as much as I care about those characters. Um, Frank Herbert's ideas are so fun, but George Martin gets me invested in the people. When Paul struggles, I literally do not care. Yeah, it, it's a harder sell. It's a harder sell. How are we defining hero? I mean, I think by hero, um, Joel Stickley just means like protagonist. I mean, the point of this example is that you make the protagonist someone who's actually very dislikable. Uh, and Joel uses um, the example of a king who is tyrannical and murderous, and like that is that's book four of Dune. So I, I, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ding Frank for this. Uh, I think Frank is guilty of picking the wrong hero, and and, and you know again like uh, there's a lot that is redeeming about God Emperor of Dune, and kind of the point like Frank's point is that the whole idea of a hero is a bad idea. So, like, I, I don't actually think that this means, that like, Dune bad or whatever. But, like, within the structure of this book that we're using as the structure for this game, I, I think that Frank fits this pattern. And and this takes us into, like, a broader discussion. Like, what what is it... Like, like, like this is a list of, like, reasons why writing can be bad. And basically, th this is a list of, like, breaking rules. Like, doing things that don't fit within the the traditional conventional style of how to write a good book. But of course, like, great artists break rules, you know? Like, Picasso did some really weird abstract faces with the eyes on the wrong side of the face, but he did that after he had mastered more representational, realistic art. And so, like, great artists break rules, and rules can be broken for bad reasons in a way that makes bad art, but rules can be broken for good reasons in ways that make good art. And I think you, I think I would argue that that Frank Herbert's decision to have protagonists who are horrible, um, and George Martin's decisions to make to have heroes that are horrible or protagonists that are horrible, both have good reasons behind them and make the art better. Um, so. So I I'm not saying that like Frank Herbert is bad because he he ha because of the protagonists that he has, um, but you know within the confines of this scientific mathematical system that we're using, um, I think Frank Herbert does fit the definition of this particular writing quote unquote mistake. So you know we'll we'll be mindful of that. Uh, number 16, using semicolons because you think they look good, not because you know how they work. Wait, let's, 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 let's do a little experiment. Let, oh, sorry. Um, let's do an experiment. Let's look at how many semicolons are in the Dune series. I can actually give you an, we can get the number right now. And the number is 465. That is how many semicolons are in the Dune series. Um... Let's look at where they've got... Where, where can we find a high concentration of semicolons? I'll, I'll do something in book one so that we're not, like, accidentally going to spoil you guys. I mean, there's a lot of semicolons uh, in in this definition of uh, Dr. Yui, uh, but that's, that, that's fine. That's structural. That's, like, a listing technique. That's, like, the correct way to use semicolons. Uh, a lot of semicolons in another sort of thing there. I, I, I think Frank's use of semicolons is restrained and appropriate here's another list using semicolons that that is all appropriate i don't think we can blame frank for that um he, he, he does suddenly get very enthusiastic about semicolons in in dune chapter 33 but like i, I that's fine I, frank is not guilty of this let's look at how many semicolons there are in a song of ice and fire the number is 2827 that is a lot more semicolons. My god, George. My god. In the prologue of, of A Song of Ice and Fire alone, 
there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight semicolons. I would not have guessed that there's that many fucking semicolons. So here he's using it as like, you know, separating two sort of sub sentences within one sentence. I was never ultra clear on how semicolons work, but my understanding is that this is sort of one of the ways you can do it. Um, is this a necessary use of a semicolon? They were old, those eyes, semicolon, older than Winterfell itself. I think that's legit. Personally, I would use an end dash, but that's just because I, I, I love the end dash and I'm a little bit afraid of semicolons. Um, so the point is that, yeah, there are a lot more semicolons in A Song of Ice and Fire than there are in in Dune. I mean, I think A Song of Ice and Fire is longer. Well, well are they comparable? Yeah, no, yeah, I think A Song of Ice and Fire is longer. I mean, there are more Dune books um, by Frank Herbert than A Song of Ice and Fire books, but I think A Song of Ice and Fire is a bit longer. They're probably about equal length, I think. Um, so yeah, there are more semicolons in A Song of Ice and Fire, but I don't think that these are being used inappropriately. Like, George is a bit more quick on the trigger with semicolons, but I, I don't think that they're too much or inappropriate. What do you guys think? Um... Oh, apparently Quinn's Ideas is in the chat. Welcome, Quinn. Hey, nice to see you. Quinn makes a lot of fantastic videos about Dune that you should all absolutely check out, along with his A Song of Ice and videos. A Song of Ice and Fire videos, great catalog on Quinn's Ideas, the YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that neither of these writers are guilty of overusing semicolons. Um, let's continue. Marigold says, are they ever necessary? Yeah. It's like, may maybe they should just be two sentences, you know? I don't know. I would use a dash, but that's just because I'm afraid of semicolons. All right, anyway, let's move on to the next point. I think that Frank and George are not guilty of using too many semicolons. Number 17. <laughs> Explain the plot all at once. So this is the writing mistake of just drop, like explaining all the mysteries and explaining everything that's happening all at once. Uh, in like a big like exposition dump with like three revelations that all sort of happen at the same time. I think I think you could argue that like the final chapter of Dune does a bit of that, but it's not really explaining. It's not really explaining as such. I mean, I think Frank Herbert is almost guilty of the opposite problem, which is not explaining the point, uh, not explaining the plot at any point. <laughs> like there are a lot of like big sort of open questions and mysteries, like central plot mysteries and ideas that are not really ever fully explained clearly. <laughs> like, if you're just getting into Dune now and you're, like, expecting everything to be explained and for you to know, like, what all the mysteries are, like, ooh, you know, who is the Kwisatz Haderach? What is the, you know, the golden path that comes in later? Uh, what is the Spacing Guild up to? What is the Bene Gesserit up to? If you're expecting clear explanations to be laid out at any point, you're going to be disappointed. Um, George R. R. Martin in A Song of Ice and Fire, the mysteries are not explained. Uh, that's because the story is not over. Or, uh, uh, but, you know, are we? can we expect to get answers to the mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire? I, I feel like part of the reason why George is taking forever to finish the series is because it's so hard to give satisfying answers to all of the mysteries. Like, you can write a list of, like, 100 unresolved mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, the, George is definitely introducing more mysteries. He's introducing more open plot points and open mysteries faster than he is explaining or concluding plot points. Um, so I don't think that Frank or George are guilty of explaining the plot all at once. I, I mean, Frank does do exposition dumps sometimes, uh, where he just explains, like, what important concepts are or, like, what's going to happen and stuff. But, like, I don't think it's all at once as such. Uh, so I, I don't think Frank or George are guilty of explaining the plot all at once. I think that they are kind of guilty of the opposite, but, yeah, I don't think we can ding them for this. What do you guys think in the live chat? Um, Dune is very open-ended, says John42, but the prequels and sequels explain all that. Yeah, well, that's if you uh, like the prequels and sequels and consider them canon, I suppose. Uh, thank you for the super chat from Angela Smith, who says, This list is everything I've ever been insecure about in writing. Yeah, it's, well, it's a great book. A Hundred Ways to Write Badly Well by Joel Stickley. I suggest you guys check it out because it, there's something about, like, getting examples of bad writing that is, like, 
so much better than getting examples of good writing, you know? Like, knowing what to avoid is somehow more helpful than knowing what to do sometimes. But yeah. Um, you could argue that June does this, but it's less explaining it all at once and more explaining one particular vague facet all at once. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes it just dumps, like, a big concept on you, like, you know, prescience or something, and it just... Or, or like, you know, the ecological transformation, or, you know, like, like there's these big ideas... Uh, where Frank just sits down and says, here's the thing. Um, so that absolutely does happen. Um, definitely the opposite for both of them, Stephen says. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're correct about that. All right, uh, let's move on to point 18, right from multiple points of view within a single scene. Oh my God, is Frank Herbert guilty of this? My goodness, Frank Herbert has chapters where he'll, like, jump into Jessica's head, and Jessica's like, wow, Yui sure is a cool guy, and then it immediately jumps into Dr. Yui's head, and he's like, oh, I'm such not a cool guy, I'm so stressed about having to betray the Atreides, and then and then it jumps back into Jessica's head, and she says something, and then she's like, wow, I can really trust Dr. Yui, and then it jumps into Dr. Yui's head, and he's like, oh, fuck, I really can't be trusted, man, this is so stressful. <laughs> Um, to the point where it can sometimes be g genuinely kind of disorienting. I, I mean, I think that, like, Frank Herbert does it in a way that, like, does make the conversations really, like, rich and, like, powerful and interesting. Because it layers all of these, like, different thoughts and feelings and motivations interweaved with the dialogue. Like, I think that he does it well. So again, like, I'm not saying that, like, you know, Frank is bad at writing for doing this, but, like, within the confines of this game, within within this 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 test that we're doing, Frank absolutely is guilty of writing from multiple points of view within a single scene. Like, that unusual, like, omniscient narrator multiple POV thing is, like, a, a defining, like, stylistic feature of the Dune books. Um, like, we can, we can show you, like, an example if we, like, go into... Like, I think the conversation with uh, Thufir and Jessica, because, like, in the, um, in the Dune book, they didn't do this in the new Dune movie, but in the Dune book, there's this whole subplot where, like, the Harkonnens manage to convince the Atreides into thinking that there's a, a traitor in their midst, and there is, it's, it's Yui, but, like, the Harkonnens sort of trick the Atreides into thinking that, like, um, Jessica is the traitor, and Leto is like, well, I know that Jessica isn't the traitor, but I'm going to pretend that I think that Jessica is the traitor, so that the Harkonnens think that I think that Jessica is the traitor, and the Harkonnens are like, yeah, but actually, Yui is the traitor. It's this, like, Galaxy Brain 4D chess game that happens. Uh, but my point is that we end up with some very tense conversations between, like, Jessica and Yui, and, like, Jessica and Thufir, um, where they, like, have these confrontations, where they, they have a lot of, like, internal thoughts... I mean, th this is the Thufir Jessica conversation, um, but I, I I guess the Yui Jessica conversation is probably a better example. Um, Yui Yui Yui, a million deaths were not enough for Yui from a child's history of Muad'Dib. <laughs> I love I love that, like because the Dune book is interspersed with all of this like all these quotes and excerpts from fictional books that sort of give historical context to what's happening within Dune, which is such a great way of giving you a sense of, like, the weightiness of these events. Like, these events are not just things that are happening to our characters. These are events that are happening to the world, to the history, you know? There's an awesome sense of weight and scale and, like, epic scope um, and just cool insights and funny moments that you get from these quotes. Anyway, so, like, you know, there is this conversation with uh, Yui um, and Jessica Um where is it? Is it chapter eight? Yeah, here we are, here we are. So, like, Jessica's talking to Yui, and, like, Yui has to hide his, you know, his coming uh, betrayal of the Atreides at the same time that he is, like, revealing his true feelings about his, like, wife, Wana, and, like, it's this really interesting, like, in emotional, rational sort of, like, dance that happens between Jessica and Yui, where Jessica is, where Yui is thinking, like, oh, you know, like, his feelings about Jessica, and then Jessica's feelings about Yui, and the layers of, like, deception, and it's tragic, and it's wonderful, and, like, that's, it's so unfortunate that this wasn't in the Dune movie, um, but it's sort of impossible to adapt to film, because it all happens, like, internally, you know, um, so what's my point? My point is that Frank Herbert is guilty 
of writing from multiple points of view within a single scene. Um, I think he does it in a good and interesting way, but he 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 is guilty of that. Uh, number nineteen, making the most of formatting. What do you guys think in the live chat? Um, George, um, welcome, Gladys. Uh, number nineteen, start writing a book when you have no idea how it will end. George is guilty of that. Okay. Um, 19. Make the most of formatting. Using lots of bolding and underlining and italics for no reason. Uh, George is not guilty of that. I mean, George does use italics to represent thoughts, which I don't know if I like that, the way George italicizes thoughts. Um, but uh, but he do at least does it in a consistent way and not in like an excessive way. Um, wait, Frank doesn't do that, does he? Does Frank... Frank, yeah, Frank does italicize thoughts as well, but he does it less than George does. So, so both of them are similar. Like they don't use underlining uh, in their books. They don't use bold. Um, I, I, I doubt there was a bold button on Frank Herbert's um, Frank Herbert's typewriter that he wrote Dune with. Uh, I, I do like this moment in the second appendix to Dune. When Frank Herbert is like, oh, space travel is really important, so it deserves to be written thus. SPACE TRAVEL! All caps, exclamation point. So that is an example of, like, Frank playing with, um, you know, the, uh, the formatting in a fun way. But that's, like, the only, you know, that's just one moment in the appendix. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't think George or Frank are guilty of this. What do you guys think in the live chat? Uh, I do like the italic thoughts, says Glidus. Um... Do the beginnings of Herbert's chapters count? Yeah, he, he uses his, like, opening quotations in italics, but I think that's fine. Um, the italics make it super easy to read, says Saucy. Yeah, I, I think it is, um, I think it is purposeful. I think it's appropriate. Um, Alyssa says that, uh, they struggle with communicating texting for modern settings. Yeah, if you're writing, like, a phone conversation or, like, a SMS conversation in a novel... What's the best way of representing that? Uh, I think in some books they like, you know, use a different font and they sort of put it in its own paragraph when there's like a text exchange. But like whether you want it to be its own separate sort of differently formatted paragraph or if you integrate it into the normal dialogue. A lot of interesting ways you could approach that, Alyssa. Um, cool. All right. Uh, number 20, base your characters on real people. So the example that Joel Stickley gives here is like a character that seems like obviously um <laughs> so so he tells this cool story where he's basically writing from the perspective of like a voyeur who is like watching this like woman and her husband and like lusting for this woman it's like this creepy voyeur character who's like watching these people and using these real life people as like the characters it's kind of a weird example that Joel Stickley uses in 100 ways to write badly well uh, but yeah, basing your characters on real people. I mean, I I feel like George, like like George's descriptions of like Tyrion Lannister and like Sam Tarly, uh, and even John to an extent. Like he writes these characters over and over who are like these like uh, physically not capable, physically not beautiful uh, people who have uh, very difficult relationships with their fathers, and they are dorks and they feel underappreciated, and they want to prove themselves, and they sort of find alternative ways of doing that. Like, George is writing about himself, you know? When George writes about Tyrion being, you know, misshapen and unloved by his father, when George writes about Sam being fat and bookish, George is obviously writing about himself. And, you know, he said that Sam Tarly is the character most like himself. Um... So do you think do you think we should ding George of this? I think we should. Um, again, like I don't I don't think like I think every writer does a certain amount of autobiographical writing, um, but it's definitely possible to overdo it and make it feel like it's wish fulfillment, like author self insert sort of stuff. Um, I, Frank, I don't think you can say that so much. I don't think that Frank's characters in Dune feel like they are like an author self insert character or like based on an actual person. I mean, you can say that Paul Atreides is based on Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> like, there are, like, historical characters who, um, who these characters are based on. Um, 
and you know like william the conqueror for daenerys in a song of ice and fire and like like war of the roses for a song of ice and fire i guess if you if you talk about historical inspirations that sort of widens it even further but i feel like we can ding george for basing some of his characters on himself and like i wonder if like tywin might be based on george's father i mean it feels a little bit rude almost to speculate on the connections between real life living authors lives and um their characters but um i i, I feel like it's definitely there thanks for the super chat from glidus who says show feet uh too many toes man it would break the internet um uh thanks for the super chat from darren who says i read all six dune books after seeing the movie and already read all of the song of ice and fire so this stream is perfect thank you thanks darren uh happy to hear your thoughts on these writers how did the fault in our stars do texts uh john green i don't remember um okay chat loves the italics uh so do we think that george martin is like inserting himself uh Alyssa says basing characters on real world experiences isn't the same as basing them on real people that's true like like it's not like you know george wrote about a you know dorky kid who grew up in bayonne new jersey and bought comic books and uh you know lived on that you know it, it, george's characters aren't like living the same lives as himself uh they're just sort of inspired by the feelings which is similar uh Batuasai says that jessica is based on frank herbert's wife in dune is she i didn't know that i hadn't heard him say that in the interviews and stuff that i've read um <laughs> connor says that we should we should ding george for saying that sam tarley is like him and then writing the fat pink mast scene because yeah that really just makes it inescapable to realize that the fat pink mast it's george writing about his own penis you know jo george has some weird descriptions of penises in a song of ice and fire we get a description of um Tyrion's penis in a storm of swords and it's described as like purple and misshapen or something I, I feel like we can ding George of this. Connor says that George is innocent of this. Marigold says guilty. We could almost have like a vote. Uh, Song says Martin's self-insert characters are still great and there's nothing wrong with him basing characters on real life inspiration. Oh, there's, there's a bit of disagreement in the chat. A lot of people, there's a bit of back and forth. And look, I, I agree with you guys. Like, I don't think it's wrong. Like, I don't think it's bad writing, but I think that it is something that georgie is doing that like fits this so would george's nfl references contribute to this problem yeah i think that's more inspiration in, in, in a general sense look i just for the fat pink mast we're going to ding george i think that like sam tarley and also like Tyrion lannister like they feel so much like self-insert characters and like tough in tough voyaging like i think that george does base his characters on real people to a certain extent. And again, I don't think that's wrong, but I think he fits it. All right. Number 21, if in doubt, initiate sex. So this is like the mistake of just like using sex scenes to like suddenly um, just break up the text. Like, what are we saying here? Like, um... yeah, it's just like suddenly doing sex for no reason in the middle of a story. I... I mean, G George obviously has sex in A Song of Ice and Fire. Do you think that he does it, like, randomly or purposelessly or in a way that, like, you know, undermines the flow of the text? I feel like he doesn't. I mean, like, th there are more sex scenes and nudity scenes in the Game of Thrones TV show, or at least the early TV show, like the first four or five seasons, than there is in the, in the A Song of Ice and Fire books. Um, and I think most of the sex scenes in the books are purposeful and not like excessive and not out of nowhere like theon greyjoy is having sex with the um captain's daughter on the mirror ham at the start of a clash of kings and that i think says something about theon's like selfishness and his like sort of seeking validation and seeking pleasure and like i, I think that that that's not like some random sex scene uh frank herbert does not have sex scenes like at all in dune um uh, that there is a certain amount of horniness that creeps into the dune books especially later on um but i would not say that frank or george like just randomly put in sex there is more sex in a song of ice and fire but but it's not 
it's not like all over the place. It's not random. It's not for nothing. So what do you guys think? Uh, yeah, purposeful in a song of ice and fire, says Billy. Um, <laughs> Shira C Star says that Harry Strickland is 100% based on a real person. It, it, Harry Strickland is funny because he's just this guy in the fifth a Song of Ice and Fire book. And he's like the leader of this like badass storied mercenary company called the Golden Company. And you would expect someone really fearsome and powerful to be in charge of the Golden Company. But Harry Strickland is just like this like old dude who just seems like a very like normal weird dude who just really likes foot baths. And he's just kind of this like chill guy who's just like yeah i just i'm just doing my thing like i guess i guess we can go to battle i don't really want to though like he's just he's just this guy and yeah i agree with you shiera he he seems like just someone who george knows and is like yeah i'll put old harry in here that'll be funny um uh, marigold says that george talks about sex for ned and cat that's true but i think again like that is quite purposeful because like that sex scene in at the start of a game of thrones like it, it it does sort of randomly happen in a similar way to this example, but but like it shows uh, Ned and Catelyn's intimacy. It shows Catelyn's hopes to like bear Ned another child. It shows Ned's tenderness, um, and you know the sex between Jamie and Cersei in the Broken Tower. That's like a plot point that like you know Bran seeing that is the reason why Bran was pushed from the tower. Um, Matthew says that, well, most sex happens for no reason, so what's the issue? Art should reflect life. I think that in writing, everything should be purposeful. Like, you're not going to describe someone having breakfast and then having lunch and then having dinner in a chapter for no reason. Like, 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 you don't just put it in there for no reason. Um, oh, yeah, like, Connor points out, um, Danny's lesbian scene. Like, yeah, there are, like, a couple of times when uh and like cersei with tana merriweather and like yeah daenerys with her handmaidens like there are a lot of sort of weird sex scenes that just sort of happen for like not a strong reason i mean like like tana merriweather and cersei shows how cersei is becoming like robert because cersei has sex with tana merriweather the same way that um robert had sex with her um so, like, the the sex is mostly purposeful and, like, character-driven in A Song of Ice and Fire. But, yeah, I, maybe we should ding him for this. Because, like, I think, you know, it does fit the trope that is in the book here. So, I, I think maybe we should ding him for that. Um, the sex in the books is never gratuitous. I mean, like, the, the Tana Merriweather Cersei Lannister scene describes, like... <laughs> It describes Tana uh, Taina Merriweather's uh, vulva as a, quote, murish swamp. And it describes her, like, brown nipples and, like, the areola. And does, I don't well, no, maybe it doesn't say areola. But, like, there is a lot of very lurid, I you know, some might say gratuitous description of sex in A Feast for Crows. So, meh. Um, it is, some people point out that the later Dune books, Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune, have a lot of weird sex stuff. I haven't read uh, Heretics or Chapter House yet. Uh, I know that there's a lot of weird, horny stuff that goes on with the honored matres and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I can't really comment on that. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I feel like we should Yara's sex scene. It's Asher in the books. Does Asher have? A, oh yeah, Asher has a sex scene with uh, her like boy toy in A Song of Ice and Fire that is, like, I don't, yeah, I don't really know what, like, the point of that was. Like, it's, it sort of shows that, you know, Asha has her own life and her own relationships and her own agency. Like, Asha has a lot of agency in her sexual relationships, which does say something about, like, the culture of the Iron Islands. Um, so, yeah, like, I, I, I think that George is good at having purposeful sex scenes. Um, but... Yeah, well, yeah, the Mercy chapters, there is a Winds of Winter preview chapter where Arya ends up in a sexual situation, even though she's, like, 12 years old. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that we will ding George for this. Like, I, I think that the way George uses sex is usually good. It, it, it does tell us things about the characters and about the world and about the relationships, but, um, you know if in doubt initiate sex i think george like i think sex is like a go-to for george like if george is like hmm how should i explore how this character is feeling i know fucking like that that's sort of what he goes for a lot of the time so i think that george is guilty of that so george is 
catching up to Frank here. The, the, the scores are getting a bit closer. Let's continue. Number 22, the, tw the 22nd writing cliche is using dramatic ellipses. Dot, dot, dot. Um, th there are some moments in Dune where there's like a lot of ellipses going on. Uh, let's, let, let's search for how many dot, dot, dots are in Dune. Like, th there are some passages where there's quite a lot, I think. Um, ooh, I searched and the ebook got upset because, um, oh yeah, that got a bit, of, that got a bit weird. Um, th there are some bits where there are a lot of ellipses in Dune, but like, it's not used in like a, it's not a dramatic Ellipses. There aren't a lot of dramatic ellipses in Dune. Um, a Song of Ice and Fire doesn't have a whole lot of ellipses, I don't think. Um, I mean, if we if we use the actual ellipse ellipsis character, yeah, look, I, I, yeah, I don't think we need to like investigate this one too much. I I don't think Dune or a Song of Ice and Fire use too many ellipses. I mean, I mean, this example by Joel Stickley is a very specific one of, like, leaving you hanging, you know? Like, ending a paragraph with an ellipsis is a pretty balls-out move. Um, and yeah, I don't think Frank or George do that very much, if at all. What do you guys think in the chat? I, I don't think they're guilty of that. Um, Fuji argues that George is guilty of that. I mean, there are a lot of cliffhangers. Um... Yeah, I, I think you guys... <laughs> People are dropping ellipses all over in the live chat. I, I, I don't think George does this a heap. Uh, here are some ellipses in... Oh, sorry, I, I want to get an actual like ellipses. Yeah, right, there's one. So let's search A Song of Ice and Fire for the actual ellipses character. <laughs> the, the White Walkers emerged silently from the shadows. Three of them, dot, dot, dot. Four, dot, dot, dot. Five, ah ha ha. Six, ah ha ha. He is doing a bit of the dramatic ellipses here. Um, mostly it's just in like dialogue. You know, I think I think these are pretty legit. Like using like the someone trailing off in their speech is an appropriate way to use an ellipsis. I think. Um, what we're looking for is more like in the text itself. But most of George's ellipses are within dialogue and speech. And people do have pauses in their speech, you know? So <laughs> here we are. Here's an example of exactly what they're talking about. Daenerys had never been so afraid, dot, 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 new paragraph, dot, 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 until the day her wedding came. <laughs> that is absolutely what they're talking about. Um, but I, I think that they don't, I think that George doesn't do it too much. Like he doesn't do it much. Like, it's mostly in dialogue. He doesn't use it in, like, a dramatic paragraph-ending way. So, I I don't think that Frank or George get pinged for this. What do you guys think? Glider says, innocent. It's just people taking their time to think about something. Yeah, I agree. It's fine in, in the dialogue. Uh, Marigold says, neither of them did this in a way that I noticed. Um, and Tissa, patient, says Saucy Fossey. Yeah. Okay. I agree. I don't think either these guys, either of these people, are guilty of this. Doesn't George put them at the end of the chapters? Says Theo. I don't think there are a lot of ellipses at the end of chapters in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like I'm not, I'm not seeing many here. Like there are some. There are like a lot of like weird cliffhangers that happen in the A Song of Ice and Fire books that like aren't in the show so much. Like, um, like Arya getting hit in the head by the Hound uh, at the Twins um, and like, you know, Theon when like Ramsay Bolton arrives. But yeah, I yeah, there's not a lot of ellipses here. Let's move on. Number 23, write thinly veiled, self-aggrandizing autobiographical fiction. Um, so just like, so, you know, like uh, Joel Stickley here uses the example of like a writer writing about a writer and how talented he is and stuff and how talented and sexy he is and how his wife is really sexy. I, I don't think that George or Frank are like this. I mean, we talked before about how I think that George does write like self-insert characters sometimes. 
Um, but I don't think George writes self-aggrandizing, self-insert characters. And I mean, Frank, like, I, I think you could make an argument with Frank that, like, the God Emperor of Dune in Book 4 is kind of like a self-aggrandizing autobiographical character. Because, a- a- and the Preacher in Dune Book 3... He's basically someone who, who just stands up and says, here are all of my wise opinions about politics. And everyone's like, wow, those are some wise ideas about politics. And and they're Frank Herbert's ideas about politics, you know? So, like, I, eh, I, I, I think you could argue that there's an element of that in Dune. Um, but I don't think the characters themselves are autobiographical. Like, I don't think that Paul Atreides or the God Emperor is, is like what Frank thinks of as himself, you know? I don't think those characters are autobiographical. What do, what do you guys think? Um, yeah. I, yeah, I think you guys kind of agree. Alyssa says you could possibly ding George for how consistently he makes grossly obese characters with hyper-redeeming qualities. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah. Y- yes, but. like, I, Like, I agree that, like... Sam and Tyrion are, like, you know, people who have bodies who are, you know, either fat or, like, differently abled or whatever, but they're still really cool characters, you know. So I I think there is a self-aggrandizing autobiographical quality. But you also mentioned Illyrio and Wyman. And Illyrio and Wyman are not good people. (laughs) Like, Illyrio is a slaver and a manipulator and a killer and not a good person. Uh, Wyman is, is extremely cool, but he is also, like, he's a cannibal, (laughs) like, he killed the Freys, uh, and served them to their friends at at a Winterfell feast, like, Wyman is a horrible person, very cool, but a horrible person, so, you know, I, I don't think that George, like, consistently does, like, self-aggrandizing, uh, uh, you know, even to the point where Illyrio and Wyman are autobiographical, so, yeah, I, I feel like we can, I feel like we can forgive that. Uh, I mean, you know, hot pie, incredibly good at baking. So, you know, so self-aggrandizing. Um, CW says, is there a cliche slash trope about overusing catchphrases? Yes, there absolutely is. And you better believe that George is going to get dinged for that. Um, yeah, all right. I think we agree. That I don't think Frank or George are, are very guilty of self-aggrandizing autobiographical characters. Number 24, the 24th bad writing cliche is narrating every scene in a matter-of-fact tone, no matter how exciting. Uh, So, you know, so so the example by Joel Stickley here is the dragon, which was larger than a single-decker bus, but smaller than a lorry, breathed some fire out of its mouth, or more properly, exchanged a mixture of flammable gas and liquid ignited by a spark from a gland in its throat. So the point is that, like, the, the writer is describing something really exciting, um, but describing it in a very boring, overly detailed way. Like, you know, the the fire-breathing incident caused a reaction of fear and surprise among the local population. Uh, the reconstruction efforts would have an adverse effect on the local economy in the medium term. I think we can... I think we can ding George for this. Uh, I mean, Frank for this. Because Frank, in June, does... You know, like, it is exciting sometimes in the way that, you know, like... Uh, when the sandworms get up to some business and there are some, like, nice sort of evocative descriptions of, like, the the, the monstrousness of the sandworms and, like, the monstrousness of the Sardaukar and stuff. Like, like that is done in an exciting way sometimes. Um, But there's also a lot of description of, like, you know, the sandworms. Ah, they are 800 feet long and uh, they, they generate oxygen through the biochemical processes in their bodies, and, you know, Paul could smell the oxygen, which he knew was, uh, was the responsible for the uh, ecological atmosphere on Dune, explaining the lack of uh, uh, green plant cover on Dune, but uh, the breathable air... I mean, like, Frank does sometimes sort of dump exposition in a place that should be more of an exciting moment. Um... So I, I I feel like we can say that, like, because, you know, the other thing that Frank does is that he skips the battles. Like, Frank often, like, the violence and stuff happens off screen in a place when, like, we could have seen the awesome battle, but instead we just got, oh, yes, the Sardaukar were defeated by the Fremen. Like, like, there's one particular bit, and this is a spoiler for the end of the first Dune book. 
spoiler warning. Um, but there is this fucking wild part in, like, I think the final chapter or one of the final chapters of Dune Book One, um, where... <laughs> Where we get a report of a battle that happened after the event, uh, and it's where uh, the Sardaukar attacked, like, the Fremen. Yeah, here we are. We get a description of a battle that happened after it happened, and we're like, oh yes, my Sardaukar were almost overwhelmed by a force composed mostly of women, children, and old men. This child, Alia, who is like, like three years old or something, was in command of one of the attacking groups. Alia says, oh, I allowed myself to be captured because I did not want to face my brother and have to tell him that his son had been killed. Uh, but the Sardaukar almost got defeated, but they used their attitudinal jets on their carrier as flamethrowers, a mark of desperation and the only thing that got them away with their three prisoners. Sardaka forced to retreat in confusion from women and children and old men. Now, doesn't that sound like an amazing chapter to have read? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been awesome to see this desperate battle between with, with, the, with the toddler Alia leading the, the, the old and, and female Fremen into battle against the Sardaukar using their spaceship as a flamethrower. Like, wouldn't that have been awesome if we actually got to see it on the page? Instead of as a description, Oh yes, my Sardaukar used the attitudinal jets on their carrier as flamethrowers. Like, it's this very sort of matter-of-fact description. I only sent five troop carriers with a light attack force to pick up prisoners for questioning. We barely got away with three prisoners and one carrier. Like, it's also matter of fact. I think Frank is guilty of this. Like, and, and this does happen in, like, other parts as well. Um, like, Frank does have some exciting scenes of, like, action. Or at least, like, the start of action or the end of action. But mostly he just sort of skips the action and instead has, like, a dry description afterwards. Uh, what do you guys think in the live chat? I, I think that Frank is guilty of this. Ashley says, guilty. Um, uh, hell yeah, I'll follow that toddler to battle. Max says that that happened to Tyrion as well. Yeah, that's true. Like, the Battle of the Blackwater. Like, we see the end of the battle uh, just as a description afterwards. But, like, we also see a lot. Like, there are multiple chapters of seeing the action uh, in the Battle of Blackwater. Uh, Alyssa says that Herbert is definitely guilty. Um, toddler's defeated in battle... Uh, yeah, okay. Looks like you guys agree. Frank Herbert is guilty of narrating every scene in a matter-of-fact tone, no matter how exciting. So he is up to five sins. Oh god, this is like cinema sins, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what we're doing is similar for, uh, to cinema sins, but for books. Oh god. Uh, all right, the 25th bad writing cliché. Is always using a thesaurus. Using, like, overly big words when you could have used a simple word. Uh, felicitous. Diminished. Mercantile. Characteristic. Like, like, obviously, it's fine to use big words if it's purposeful, if it's meaningful. Like, if it is the best word to use in that situation. Um, but if you're using a big word instead of a small word, you should use the small word. Like, the one that always pisses me off, sometimes people say... Oh, uh, you know, this particularly affects uh, individuals of a tall persuasion. Just say tall people. Like, if you're saying, oh, individuals of a low socioeconomic situation, just say, like, well, I, okay, I mean, maybe poor people would be rude, or, like, rich people would be rude. But, like, you know, like, like specifically, don't say individual. Say people. Why the fuck would you ever say individual when you can say people? I mean, if you're talking about individualism, sure. If you're talking about individuality or something in a way that sort of the word individual makes more sense, fine. But like, if if you if you mean people and you say individual, just say people. Jesus Christ. Um, so you know, always use a thesaurus. Do we think that Frank and George are guilty of using overly long, fancy words when they could use simple words? I, I think that you know Frank does use some like quite fancy words sometimes. But I think that it's usually purposeful. And I think also, like, maybe language in the 60s was, like, you know, maybe a little bit different to language now, you know? I, I think that George definitely... Like, George uses some very fancy words sometimes. Uh, George uses, like, uh, medieval-style words or fantastic... You know, like, historical words, like, old words, archaic words. Um... But, I mean, you know, that is very much to sort of set the feel, you know, the medieval feel of A Song of Ice and Fire. So, you know, I, I think that it's justified 
um, and not excessive for both George and Frank. What do you guys think in the live chat? Uh, no diggity says that Frank was very precise with language. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Dune is is partly about language and the use of language and the importance of how we use language. Uh, Marigold in, in the live chat says, "Got to disagree with you. Using large words that also fit the bill help us keep those words alive. And English is already so lacking in descriptors. So you're saying that we should like keep words on life support just for the sake of." keeping them alive. I, I think that languages obviously have like cultural and academic value. And I think like languages should definitely be like studied and preserved. I don't know if I agree that we should use large words just so those large words like don't die out. Just, like using large words just so that we can use those large words. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, but you know, language certainly is like beautiful and valuable in and of itself. Uh, Glidus says, mod me, I'll keep the robots at bay. Okay. Uh, you are now a mod, Glidus. I entrust you with this power. My sword on both your shoulders. Um, so you can fight the bots. Um, Lovecraft is guilty of this. Uh, George thinks he's at some medieval fair. Yeah, I mean, sometimes George feels like he's LARPing a bit. <laughs> Like, he's just out there, like, saying, Oh, yes, the, the, the mead was poured, and, uh, and, oh, mine uncle put his soup into the trencher of bread, which is what people used in medieval times, didn't you know? Like, like, yeah, I think it is a bit cringy sometimes. Like, I, I can feel that. Uh, there's purpose in Frank's word use. I mean, yeah, in a similar way that George uses, like, archaic medieval words, um, Frank uses... Arabic terms and like words from other languages for the specific purpose of like evoking those cultural traditions and, and philosophical traditions. So like I I, I agree. I, I think that Frank and George, you know, they both do a certain amount of it. Uh, we got David Lightbringer in the chat who says, I think that George very intentionally uses simple prose and complex ideas as opposed to the opposite, which is terrible. Um, yeah, I, I think that Frank Herbert definitely uses simple prose and complex ideas for sure um George, i think george does sometimes use somewhat flowery prose but like yeah i i, I generally I, I agree with you guys that um yeah i think we can allow this <laughs> thank you glidus for keeping webcamschat.com out of the chat glidus is saving us okay cool um let's continue i think that both George and Frank are innocent. Chapter number 26, writing sin number 26, choose one character to bully. So Joel Stickley uses a funny example of a character called Dingleton, and everything terrible happens to Dingleton in comical ways, and it's, it's just shooting on this one character over and over. I don't think that... Um, I don't think that Frank or George do this. Like, with, with Frank, I will say... Uh, when you read June book three, and I, I won't, I won't spoil, but um, there's a particular character who is a, a female character who is in charge in June book three, who does kind of get shit on by the book a lot. Actually, yeah, all right. So, so you know, spoiler warning for June book three. So close your ears for half a minute. Um, because in June book three, spoiler warning, Alia, Paul's sister Alia is the like the regent ruler of the universe. And the book does shit on her a lot. <laughs> like it sort of says that, well, you know, Alia, she had all these like memories and powers, but she really just failed to handle it. And so she got possessed by the Baron Vladimir and she just keeps making these, oh, that was a bad decision, Alia. And look at Alia's villainy. And, uh, and then in the end, Alia commits suicide because she fails to uh, succeed in overcoming the Baron. And again, like spoiler warning for book three, because like the ending in particular feels like it's really shitting on Alia. Um, it's so cold. Um, help yourself, is that the line? No. Uh, wait, yeah, no, it is a line. Yeah, th look at this. So, spoiler warning, like, the the ending of Children of June, the third June book, Alia has been, like, criticized for her decisions and for her weak will, like, all throughout the book. And then, like, Alia pleads to be saved by... She, she, she begs her mother and she begs her brother, help me, help me. And what does Leto say? Help yourself. And what does Alia do? She jumps out the window and dies. So, like, my god. Like, I feel like Frank is really making an example of how Alia is shit. 
to to a point that it's like, man, this is like bullying. Like, I feel bad for what Frank is doing to Alia. Um, so, you know, spoiler warning over. Um, do, do you guys agree? Do you guys feel like Alia is being sort of like, Frank is really harsh to Alia? Um, now says, I thought you were talking about Wensika. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Wensika, the, the mother of, of Faradun, is, is also like kind of held up as an example of just someone who is terrible. And I mean, you know, the Baron Vladimir is also um obviously you know a terrible person uh, i mean chris santos points out that george bullies samuel tarley and that's true like samuel tarley is sort of mocked and bad things happen to him and he's sort of oh he's like an ugly fat pig and stuff um but also there's, there is a lot that is redeeming about sam and i think that sam is going to end up in a pretty i think sam's going to get a happy ending I mean, ooh, fat pink, fat pink mask, happy and en happy ending. Um, so yeah, like I, 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 I don't think that George is guilty of this so much. Like, like there are characters that lots of bad things happen to. Obviously, I mean, Arya goes through so much bullshit, but they are still sort of framed as heroes in a lot of ways. Uh, Dolorous Ed is someone who sort of bad things happen to, or you know, Ed says that bad things happen to him. Um, Winter says about Alia that she did one thing and then Paul was like, oh no, she's lost forever. No hope. Yeah, right? Like, like the, the book and Paul are just like, well, we'll just write off Alia. There's no helping Alia. She's fucked. It's like, what? Like, why don't you try and help her more? Like, it, like it's really harsh what, what, what June does with Alia. So do you guys think that, oh my God, um, can we, uh, put user in timeout? Okay. Uh, Gliders, please fight the spam. Um, Ashley says, does Brienne count? She's bullied, uh, but the point is to prove herself. Yeah, yeah, that's another great example. Like, bad stuff happens to Brienne, but, like, she overcomes it, you know? Um, Alia was a victim of circumstance, yeah. But it's so fucked up that the moral of the story is, like, if you're unlucky and if you're weak, you're fucked, you know? And that's sort of a broader thing in June, where, like, some people are better than others in Dune. Some people are genetically superior in Dune. And if you are inferior, there's no saving you, you know? Which is, which is kind of a fucked up morality. Um, especially with, you know, the eugenic undertones, you know? So, so do we think that Frank is guilty of choosing one character to bully? I mean, kind of. Kind of with Alia, I feel. Um, and, like, you know, even characters like, you know, like Korba or something. Like, there are, there are people who sort of exist as like examples of what not to be and like vladimir sort of not really i don't know do you get do you guys think frank is guilty um theon well yeah that yeah i mean that's a great point george um absolutely does so many horrible things to theon to the point where it feels excessive um like my god like was it necessary to torture theon as much as he was tortured um <laughs> yeah, I gotta stop saying fat pink mask. Fat, fat pink mast. It's hard to say. Uh, Billy says that both are guilty. Yeah, well, Theon is definitely bullied the more I think about it. Duncan Idaho. I mean, Duncan is complicated. Uh, Frank is guilty. Alia felt excessive because there wasn't enough build up. I, I agree. Like, Alia just sort of. Like, we didn't get to see the, 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 the slow way... Um, well, we sort of do in book three, but... Eh, eh. You guys think both are guilty? All right, well, well all right, let, let, let's give both of them... Let's give both of them a ding. Because, like, George is so brutal in how, like, Theon and even, like, Arya and stuff, like, just terrible stuff happens to them, and, like, and, like Sam. And yes, it is pretty purposeful, but, like, I think you can say that it's excessive. And Frank, you know, with some characters like Alia, like, like, like there are characters in Dune where it's just like they just exist to be examples of what not to be. And it's just fucked up, you know. Um, so, you know, it, it's sort of questionable, but I, I think we'll give both of them dings. Half a point. Yeah, I agree. Like they, they both get one. So they sort of cancel each other out. I think it's fine. OK, uh, let's move on to <laughs> let's move on. To the 27th writing mistake, signpost your twists. Now, <laughs> Frank is so guilty of this. Like, Frank, like, like, in Dune, they tell you that Yui is the traitor and Leto is gonna die in, like, chapter two. Um, and throughout the book, in those little historical ex ex excerpts, they tell you 
the twist before it happens. Uh, in, in, in many ways, repeatedly. Uh, which again, is kind of the point, because it's about prescience and like future knowledge and like how that sort of alters your perspective on the world. It's purposeful, uh, and it is subversive, uh, but he absolutely is guilty of it. Um, George Martin does so much foreshadowing. Like, the Red Wedding. Like, the, the, there's like six or seven different chapters that foreshadow the Red Wedding in different ways. And they're all subtle ways. Like, it's not like Frank Herbert, where Frank is like, Hey, Leto's gonna die. <laughs> it's gonna He's gonna be betrayed by Yui, and he's gonna die. That's what's gonna happen. Signpost, signpost. For, George is different because he uses this sort of symbolic, ambiguous foreshadowing, foreshadowing which makes theorizing so interesting. Um... So I think Frank is definitely guilty of this more and in a different way, to a different extent, than than George is. Um, I don't think that we can ding George for this, because I think that he's foresha it's foreshadowing, not signposting, you know? What do you guys think in the live chat? I, I think we have to ding Frank, but not George. Uh, Nasia says both are guilty. Uh, yeah, D Daenerys sees the Red Wedding in the House of the Undying. I mean, Daenerys' House of the Undying visions are just like a whole sequence of... Signposting and foreshadowing. Um, beautiful little signs. I mean, I agree. Like, like, like the signposting in June, I think, is purposeful and effective and fun. Um, George is great at those big events that seem inevitable in retrospect, but still surprise, right? I agree. Um, and, 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 and Frank is different because he, he likes signposts stuff and he tells you what's going to happen and then it happens. So it's not surprising when it happens, but it is still interesting to explore how it happens and the implications and the consequences of what happens. So, you know, Frank, yes, George, no, George is innocent. Yep. All right. I agree with you guys. I think that Frank is guilty of signposting his twists and George is not. Let's move on to the 28th bad writing cliche, refusing to resolve mysteries. <laughs> Oh boy. I mean, this one's hard because like in A Song of Ice and Fire, there are literally dozens, probably hundreds, there are hundreds of unresolved mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, maybe uh, these mysteries will all be resolved in the ending of A Song of Ice and Fire, but you know, so, so it's not like the story is refusing to resolve the mysteries. But George R. R. Martin is refusing to write the story that resolves the mysteries. So, I mean, I think for that, we have to, we have to say that George is guilty of, of this. Um, Frank Herbert, I mean, there is a lot of ambiguity in Dune about sort of the meanings and the real sort of plans and the real sort of fulfillment of the prophecies. Um, I think that that's kind of part of the point of Dune is that, you know, the world is complicated. It depends on your perspective. Like the whole idea of prophecy is like kind of bullshit. The whole idea of prediction is bullshit. You know, individual agency trumps, you know, prophetic control. So, you know, like, like, and, and there aren't all that many mysteries in Dune. I, I mean, like, you know, the spacing guild are very mysterious and Frank refuses to resolve that. And there are lots of ambiguities in, like, the history. And, you know, you know there are mysteries in Dune that Frank refuses to resolve. But there's not very many of them. Um, and the, and it's, it's very sort of excusable in the way that it's done. Like, it doesn't wave in your face, like, oh, you'll never know this thing. Whereas, like, George is like, you know... Uh, you know, who are John? Who are John's parents? Wh what are the old gods? Um, what is the nature of the White Walkers? You know, like, like, like there are so many mysteries. Like, where is Benjen? What happened to Ashara Dane? And and we are constantly teased by these mysteries. They keep getting brought up all the time. Um, you know, what the fuck was Rhaegar's plan? Like, I, I, and I don't think we are going to get answers to all those things. I think that George loves dangling mysteries in front of our face much more than he is actually willing to resolve those mysteries. And again, like, it, it's impossible to really judge because we haven't got the ending to A Song of Ice and Fire. Maybe he will resolve those mysteries, but, like, I think that it's pretty obvious that he he can't resolve all of them. And, what you know, so, so, so I think George gets dinged for this and Frank does not. What do, what do you guys think? Uh, Golemok says, I think Frank basically explained what he wanted to explain. I agree. Like, like, I think Frank had a plan 
more than George had a plan. Like, Frank never intended to explain all of the details of the motivations of the Spacing Guild, but he did intend to explain his ideas about, like, prophecy and power and, and stuff, and so and he, and he does do that. Like, not... He doesn't spell out everything, but he explains what he wants to explain. I agree with you, Golomok. Um, Glidus has resigned himself to never finding out what happened to Red Ralph Stonehouse. What about Stone Snake? The Night's Watchman. What happened to him? Uh, what's what's with that lemon tree in, in Bravos? Or was it really Bravos? Ooh. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that um, George gets dinged for this. Um, George Mystery Box. Uh, yeah, George is... <laughs> David Lightbringer says that George is uh, just trying to support the A Song of Ice and Fire YouTuber economy by, <laughs> by leaving room for theories. We can be thankful f to George for that, I suppose. Where is Aladim? Lightning NC asking the real questions. Uh, okay, um, let's, let's ding George for this. I, I think George has earned this one for uh, refusing to resolve his mysteries. The 29th bad writing cliche is making your villain genuinely evil. So the idea here is that, like, if you make your villain so cartoonishly over-the-top evil, I am pure evil and want nothing more than the death of all humanity. Like, like, making your villains so evil to the point where they are just one-dimensional and ridiculous. Now, <laughs> the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen is this, right? And in A Song of Ice and Fire, like, Ramsey Bolton is this. Like, like Ramsey Bolton uh, and uh, Vladimir Harkonnen have a, lot of, have a lot in common, actually, because they both are um, rapists, they both uh, like torture. I mean, I mean, Vladimir says that he only uses torture when he has to, and it's more Piter that enjoys torture. But, like, whatever, like, like, like their regimes, like, like, the Harkonnens and the Boltons have a lot of parallels, and they both are murderous that they they enslave people they they rape they they do like all of the most extreme things that are evil to do like the boltons live in the dread fort you know like like the harkonnens live in gaiety prime where there's no sunlight um they both are just ridiculously over the top cartoonish evil now um george martin has a lot of complica complicated villains like the Lannisters, like the Lannisters are villains, and they are wonderfully layered and complex. Um, so, Fra so George is maybe you know he's he's got a lot of sort of layers going on there. Um, Frank Herbert has some sort of layered villains. I mean, you, you could you could maybe say that the God Emperor of Dune is is a kind of a layered villain. Um, but you know, he also has these sort of uncomplicated villains like uh, Vladimir Harkonnen, um, and you know the Emperor. Should arm the fourth in Dune is pretty unambiguously evil. I mean, not to the same extent as Vladimir Harkonnen, but sort of the more you learn about the Emperor Should arm the fourth, the more you realize he is just an irredeemable bag of dicks. Um, so I feel like we can ding Frank for this, and I think we can also ding George for this for the for the Boltons. Um, and you know the brave companions, the bloody mummers are just ridiculously over the top evil the brave companions weren't in um the game of thrones tv show but in the book they are just this over the top cartoonish monstrously evil group of people uh ramsey yeah the mountain is another example i mean tywin is is more sort of complicatedly evil i mean one of the interesting things is that in the a song of ice and fandom there are lots of people who who will argue to they will die on the hill of arguing that tywin is actually justified and tywin is actually he's just doing what's necessary man i think there's a lot of a song of ice and fire fans who really feel the need for a strong father figure in their life and so that's why they like tywin um so you know i i, I would say that tywin is is more of a complicated and com compelling villain but um yeah the baron and raban are kind of extreme fade ralpha as well in the second half of the first june book i mean frank herbert has said that Fade Ralpha is like this totally one-dimensional villain with no redeeming characteristics. Like, our introduction to Fade Ralpha in Dune, and this is not a spoiler, I don't think, like, our introduction to Fade Ralpha Harkonnen is, uh, on his 16th birthday, Fade Ralpha Harkonnen killed his 100th slave gladiator, and we learn that the Harkonnens routinely uh, get these slaves and they drug the slaves and then kill them for fun. And they're drugged so that they can't really fight back. <laughs> so it's not even a fair fight. 
Um, so yeah, the Harkonnens are just cartoonishly evil. Um, Daddy Tywin. I think a lot of people love Daddy Tywin. Um, a villain doesn't need to be justified to be layered. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think that's what Tywin is. I agree, huge ass. I think Tywin is not justified, but he is layered. I think Tywin is a fantastic character. Super interesting character. Like, his own father issues and the way he's shaped by his society. Like, so interesting. Uh, Adam says that George said that Lord of the Rings, uh, those books were very good, but there was no sex and there was no religion. But there's lots of it in A Song of Ice and Fire. Yeah. History weebs love Tywin. Um... Mountain just has migraines. I, th I think I have been guilty of, like, overly emphasizing. Like, I find it interesting that the Mountain Gregor Clegane has migraines and th there is some there is some attention to, like, the pain that the Mountain feels, which I find interesting. Like, I really like it when villains are humanized, like Tywin is. But yeah, like, I, I, I would not make the mistake of saying that just because the Mountain has headaches, it's okay that he murders people. Like, obviously not. But I, I think that, that makes him more interesting. Whereas, like, the, the Harkonnens, we, ne we never really, like, see, like, why the Harkonnens are as evil as they are. Like, I guess, like, you know, the Harkonnens and Shaddam the Fourth, they both um, are products of their system, of the political realities of their system. Like, the Imperium is a place where the brutal and the murderous survive and, you know, shit floats, you know? That's how these dickheads become the rulers of the universe. And even the Atreides, you know, the Atreides do these morally questionable things like using propaganda and exploiting the Fremen and, like, manipulating people and lying at times. Like, even the heroic Atreides, like, like Leto has a line I, I can't remember it exactly, but Leto Atreides, Atreides has a line where he's like, in order to survive on Dune, we may have to do things that will make us hate ourselves. You know, we may have to do things that we don't like. We may have to do, we have to, we have to make moral compromises in order to survive as politicians. Um, so what's my point? My point is that I think that the Harkonnens are just genuinely evil, and I think that the Boltons are just genuinely evil. So I think that both Frank Herbert and George Martin get a point for their for for, for committing this bad writing cliche. Uh, so uh, Frank Herbert is still in the lead here. Number thirty, right outside your comfort zone. So in the book One Hundred Ways to Write Badly Well by Joel Stickley, which is linked in the description, and you should all check it out because it's the structure of this video. Uh, the example is, you know, someone who doesn't know anything about science writes about science, uh, and it's just cringy and bad. Um, and well, look. <laughs> In the fourth Dune book, and this is not a spoiler, but in the fourth Dune book, uh, Frank Herbert has a lot of very strong opinions about homosexuality um, that I think are outside his comfort zone. Uh, I think in that specific example, Frank Herbert could be accused of uh, writing about something that he knows nothing about um, in that specific example. But I think in a lot of other examples, Frank Herbert... Uh, has research and has knowledge to back up his opinions in a lot of other ways. Like, he writes a lot about uh, environments and environmentalism and technology in ways that come from real-world experience. Like, Frank Herbert, uh, one of his, his other books was about submarines, and so he's talked about how, you know, he studied submarines, he'd, he'd learned about the engineering, he went down in a submarine, he, like, built his own systems to experiment with, like, the technology behind submarines. And, you know, that's true of, like, his, his sustainability and, like, energy experiments. So, like, I think Frank Herbert, uh, he, re he really puts his brain where his mouth is, to mix my metaphors. I think that Frank Herbert, like, does the research and does the work most of the time to justify his writing. So I, I feel like Frank Herbert is innocent of this, mostly. Uh, George R. R. Martin, he does know a lot about medieval history. He has been accused, like, I've read a lot of smart people who are medieval historians who say that George Martin is guilty of... Uh, being wrong about medieval history in some ways. There are a lot of cliches where, like, you know, George, George Martin sometimes, he writes about, like, he, he perpetuates misconceptions about medieval history. Like, one thing that I've written is, like, all of his, like, child brides um, and women dying in childbirth and, like, you know, young women having children really, really early. Like, that happens a lot in Fire and Blood, um, in ways that aren't strictly historically accurate, according to what I've read. 
Um, so you could argue that George Martin is guilty of this. Like, his medieval history is a bit questionable. Um, and, you know, like, you can you can go back and forth. Like, I mean, it's, you know, George Martin is not claiming to write accurate, realistic medieval history. There's dragons in it, you know? Like, it is fiction. Uh, it is fantasy. So, you know, he doesn't have to be historically accurate. But he is also, at the same time, sort of claiming to, you know, like, he justifies his inclusion of uh, rape in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, there's so much rape in the battles in A Song of Ice and Fire and in the conflicts. And um, he justifies that by saying, well, that's what happens in real history, so therefore that's what I do in the real world. So it's like Frank is sort of... Uh, George is trying to have his cake and eat it too. He's saying, like, well, you know, I do these all of this weird sex stuff in my books because I'm being historically accurate. But he's also like, yeah, but I'm going to put dragons and white walkers in it too. <laughs> uh, so what do you guys think? Do you think George is guilty of writing outside his comfort zone? I mean, I don't think it's outside his comfort zone. I think he's just guilty of like infusing his fantasies into his, you know, history. But I, I think Frank is mostly innocent of this. Like, I think that some of Frank's... I mean, well, no. I mean, well, here's another thing about Frank. Dune, and specifically the Fremen people, are inspired by Islam and inspired by Middle Eastern and Arabic peoples. Um, and, you know, Frank did research about some of these peoples and some of these cultures and these languages and these religions. But, you know, Frank is not an expert on Islam. Um, and yet he uses a lot of Islamic terms. Um, and, you know, he's taking creative liberties. He's, he's not claiming that, you know, the Fremen are identical to Islamic and Arabic peoples. Um, but he's using Arabic words and he's using the trappings in a way that maybe is outside his comfort zone. Like, in the same way that, that George arguably misuses real historical medieval history, you could argue that Frank misuses um, Islamic and Arabic concepts and culture and also like uh buddhist concepts and zen concepts he uses a lot with like the bene Gesserit and he's like you know self-development ideas um so what do you guys think like i think you can make a pretty good argument for both george and frank being guilty of writing outside their comfort zone i think that they're usually taken more as like creative inspiration in a way that like is appropriate uh but what do you guys think in the live chat let's have a look um, Lightning says, "Oh come on, are you making a cultural appropriation argument?" I, I, I'm not argue. I'm not saying that it's like inherently wrong for like Frank to take inspiration from Arabic cultures, and I'm not saying that it's wrong for George to take uh, inspiration from from medieval history. No, I'm not making that argument. But I think that you can do it in a way that is like like cliche and cringy and ill informed and like doesn't work. Um, I think you, you can make that argument. Um, Saucy says neither are guilty. Connor says innocent. Fuji says George is innocent. 30 says that Frank also had limited knowledge with not having the internet. Yeah, I mean, it is impressive that Frank managed to learn as much as he did in the 60s, you know, just by using books and just by studying at universities and stuff. Um... Is Islam off limits to all people who are not Muslim? Both innocent. We, we could easily spiral into a um, cultural appropriation argument that I'm not really interested in um, having. But um, architecture in A Song of Ice and Fire is a bit much. I mean, that's where the fantasy creeps in in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, it is explicitly, like, over-the-top fantastical. I mean, I mean, I mean, George also fucked up. Like, there's, like, George has said that, like, oh, and I said that the wall is 600 feet tall, and then I looked at something that was 600 feet tall in real life, and I was like, fuck, that's way too tall. Uh, but, yeah, all right, I think there's an agreement that neither of these things are... Neither of these guys are guilty. You guys say that they're innocent. Okay, I agree. Um, I think, I think you know, that they do make questionable choices in their representations and their uses of, of real history and culture, but, yeah, I agree. Okay. Writing cliche number 31. Let your characters explain themselves. Uh, so I think the idea here is that, like, instead of actually, like, showing us how characters feel, the characters just say how they feel. Um, instead of really, like, experiencing a character's emotions through the quality of the writing, we are just told how the characters feel. I, I think you could uh, make an argument... Uh, for this with June. 
Like, if we just search Dune with the search terms, like, afraid, fear, scared, um, what are some other, like, emotions that overcome the characters in Dune? Um, I mean, I mean, a fear is the main one, because, like, fear is at the center of, like, the litany against fear and, and stuff like that. So if, if we look at, like, the descriptions of fear in Dune, um... The almost invisible hesitation, a nervous betrayal he felt as fear. The fear in her voice, what does she fear? The fear he sensed radiating from his mother. Pride overcame Paul's fear. You know, th th there is, you know, he felt a sharp pang of fear. Like, it does sort of just, like, tell us how they fear. Don't let a woman's fears cloud your mind. No woman wants her loved ones endangered. I think uh, I think I think Frank might have been a little bit outside of his comfort zone writing women sometimes. Um, so yeah, like they do talk about fear. Although you know, like the specific example we're talking about in Hundred Ways to Write Badly Well is like characters saying in dialogue how they feel, and that doesn't happen very much in June. Um, as for A Song of Ice and Fire. I think the the writing of like characters' emotions in A Song of Ice and Fire is is very good. I I, I don't think that George ever really says I feel this or I feel that. So I, I feel like both of these guys are innocent. I think Frank is questionable, but I think that both of these guys are innocent in terms of like characters explaining their feelings. I I, I mean like you know I mean some of the romance is very like expository in June, like we were talking about, you know Paul and Shani and like some of the romances in. Uh, books like two and three and four like they just sort of happen like the characters just say ah oh, yes i fell in love with you so let's be in love it's like what but i, I don't think i would quite ding them uh colin says that germ is innocent zach says that june uses so much telling rather than showing i agree uh, oliver says in june they say what the characters are feeling all the time but they explain that away with them seeing it with the psychic witch sense stuff yeah, well, yeah, there is a lot of stuff where, like, you know, with Jessica's enhanced Bene Gesserit perception, she determined that the man was whittling himself. He was very afraid. Uh, and, you know, Jessica felt fear, but she overcame it with her Bene Gesserit training. Like, there is a lot of dry description of emotions, for sure. Um, he reckons that Frank is guilty. I think most of you think that they're both innocent. Yeah, like, I, I think there's definitely uh, hellbird says that there's a big difference between characters describing themselves in dialogue versus describing how they feel in internal monologue therefore herbert is innocent i think that's a good argument hellbird um because yeah like this 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 trope in the book is explaining through dialogue and i don't think frank or george do this so let's move on writing cliche number 32 end with an unexpected moral so Joel Stickley here writes a, a fun story about like a cute mouse and a cute, a cute dog, except all of a sudden, like we realize that it turns into like a, a moral for like uh, uh, addictions, like someone has a drug addiction and Diggory Dog stages an intervention against mouse's uh, addiction. Uh, so like, like it's like shoehorning a moral out of nowhere into the ending of a story. Um, Frank in Dune is definitely, like, pushing certain opinions and, like, morals. Like, you know, uh, beware of the unforeseen consequences of fucking with the environment. Uh, beware of charismatic leaders in politics and religion. Um, but I would not say it's, like, an unexpected moral that comes out of nowhere. It is foreshadowed pretty heavily, like, all throughout the Dune trilogy. Like, he does build up to these ideas. Like, that is what the books are about. It's not like the moral suddenly comes out of nowhere. So I think that Frank... Like, like, and, you know, Frank has talked about this in interviews. He's like, well, you know, yes, like, I do have, like, uh, morals or messages that I put into my stories, but I want to put, like, the drama and the entertainment first. And so, you know, yeah, I, I think that Frank is innocent of this. George Martin, I think, is less interested in, like, pushing a certain moral message like he's certainly like he's more engaging with like storytelling itself um and subverting like genre tropes and like questioning certain assumptions about storytelling um i mean again it's it's difficult because uh, we don't have an ending for a song of ice and fire like i guess george could do something weird where right at the end he's like 
And then John realized that the White Walkers, uh, th th they were not evil at all. They were simply caused by the emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere of Westeros. And therefore, the moral is, uh, we better do something about climate change. That's what the White Walkers were about all along. Like, like that. that's an example of, like, if George ended A Song of Ice and Fire with an unexpected moral. But, like, he has not done that, and I don't think that's where he's going. So I think that Frank and George are innocent of this bad writing trope. What do you guys think? Um, there's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, Jonathan. In the Game of Thrones TV show, uh, they, like, very suddenly did some weird messages. Like, like Bran talked about, ooh, it's all about memory. The White Walkers were about memory and, like, not forgetting all along. Like, what? And then Tyrion is like, well... Yeah, we don't have to resolve any of these character arcs because Game of Thrones was actually about just storytelling being good all along. Therefore, Bran is king. So yeah, I think you could accuse D&D &D and Game of Thrones of doing this. Um, but I don't think that uh, George or Frank are guilty of this. Uh, mor morals are for 8th grade book reports, indeed. Uh, innocent on both. Alright, yeah, I agree. I think we're going to... Yeah, I, th I think they're both innocent. All right, uh, moving on to number 33. Bad writing cliche. Exclaim! Using lots of exclamation points. Let's see how many exclamation points there are in the Dune series. There are 5,607 exclamation points in Dune. Uh... Quite a lot of them, actually, in dialogue and stuff. These wrangling fools, thought Fader Alpha. Um, but yeah, like, so, so there's a lot of them in dialogue, but it's like, um, it's not in the text itself, which is more what this uh, trope is. And I'm pretty sure George Martin doesn't do exclamations outside of dialogue either. So I think, uh, I think that they're both innocent of this. Um, let's look at bad writing cliche number 34, recap the previous book. There is a bit of this, um, in Dune and in A Song of Ice and Fire, because these are long, complicated stories, so there needs to be a certain amount of recapping. There's not heaps of it, though. I think, if anything, like, there could probably be more of it, um, in Dune. I, I mean, like, you know, I won't spoil anything, but, like, in, at the beginning of, like, Dune Messiah, for example, like, there is, like... And uh, God Emperor of Dune, like, they both start with an expository out-of-universe text that says, Oh yes, here's a historical summary of what happened in the Dune universe over the last 1,000 years, yes. Um, and so there is a bit of recapping. Um, but it's not done in, like, this awkward, dense, cringy way. Um, and it's not done excessively. And, and, and George doesn't do it very much. I think George could almost do it a bit more. Like, George, I think, sort of relies on us, you know, being able to look up the Wikipedia summary if we need to, you know? Uh, so I don't think these guys are guilty. What, what do you guys think? They both do it well. Yeah, they both do it a bit. Frank recaps the previous book but forgets what happens and gets it wrong. I, I think that Frank uh, might have suffered from having to do entirely, like, handwritten notes and typewriters and things. I think it's harder for it was harder for Frank to keep track of all the details because there are some mistakes in Dune, some sort of contradictions in like the timeline and stuff like that. Um, it's not a it's not a big deal though. Um, it's it's just like small details. Um, yeah, I don't think either of them. Uh, Angela says, "What happens to the winner and loser of this exercise?" Um, <laughs> Well, there's not much we can do to George. I think if, uh, to, to Frank, if George loses, I think we should uh, lock him in a cabin in New Zealand until he finishes wins. Okay, yeah, I think these guys are innocent. Uh, bad writing cliche number 35. Use onomatopoeia to make your writing pop. <laughs> well, there is, uh, there is a bit of this in uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. If I run a search for, uh, ooh, <laughs> look at this. A war horn blew. Haru. The Lannister trumpets answered. Da 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 da. There is a lot of goddamn onomatopoeia. Uh, and then when like um, all the all the wolf howling that Bran does. Oh my god! Look at all the onomatopoeia. 
Oh, splash, splish, splush. <laughs> I think I think we're gonna have to do George for this because he's doing a lot of onomatopoeia. Is this, is this another horn? It's mostly war horns. Ooh. And, and you know th this is what George does. Like like he's very uh, he's very into the simulating the senses and like the sounds and the sights of his colorful fantastical worlds. He's full of it. Hodo. Um also like I think the the uh the dragon binder horn in um at the king's moot. I I think there's a good re sound actually there. Ari that's the sound of the dragon horn. I think we've got to do George for this cuz again like I love him for it. Like this is just pure enthusiasm, but god is he guilty of of excessive onomatopoeia. So yeah, I think I think we got to ding George for that. Uh with Frank Herbert there is some onomatopoeia with like the thumpers that that go thump 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 in the desert. But there's not a lot of onomatopoeia. Frank is not as interested in doing like vivid descriptions of stuff. Um so I think that George is guilty and Frank is innocent. What do you guys think? Uh Light Dampire says at the bottom of your page, ka ka ka. Well, that's the example by um Joel Stickley. So again, we're using the book 100 Ways to Write Badly Well by Joel Stickley to structure this video. And yes, there are some very fun and silly um <laughs> Examples of onomatopoeia here. Bling-a-ding-a-ding. -a -ding. Uh, Alright, yeah, so, so do you guys agree? George guilty? Should have added onomatopoeia for Danny's diarrhea. Diarrhea onomatopoeia is a, is a wonderful rhyme. Pretty excited about that one. Um, yeah, okay, moving on. Uh, so George is guilty of onomatopoeia. Frank is not. George is catching up. Who's gonna win? Bad writing cliche number 36. Use fate as a plot device. <laughs> and the example is George pontificating. Um, yeah, well, David's the right choice because it's his destiny. Yes. Uh, his rise to power. Cultural touchstones. The fall of Lucifer. Narrative momentum. So, so this is the cliche of someone being the chosen one. And the plot device of someone being the prophetic hero, the prince that was promised, the Kwisatz Haderach. So, both George Martin with A Song of Ice and Fire and Frank Herbert in Dune are explicitly very interested in prophecy. And in the chosen one, and in the hero whose destiny is to save the world. And both of these stories are very focused on subverting and questioning and undermining the whole idea of a prophesied hero. Is John or Daenerys really a good thing for Westeros? Uh, and in Dune, is Paul Atreides really a good thing for the universe of Dune? Um, short answer for both of those things. Um, not really. <laughs> It's complicated, but kind of no, is I think the the answer. Uh, I mean, again, like, you know, the, there's no ending to A Song of Ice and Fire, so it's hard to draw conclusions. But, you know, Daenerys probably will go a bit evil. Jon will probably make terrible sacrifices to save the world. Um, and, you know, I won't spoil Dune, but there are some very good reasons to think that the Messiah and the Kwisatz Haderach is, is kind of a bit of a fucking disaster and not a good thing at all. Um, so, sh so should we ding them both? I mean, like, they're both guilty, so they kind of cancel each other out. I, I think we, we can say they both are guilty of using fate as a plot device. I mean, I, I, in a way, I think that Frank is even more guilty of this, because, like, some of the characters in Dune just are straight up more important, more powerful, because they come from the special bloodline, and because they have, that they were born with these special powers, uh, like, you know, the, the, this is like book two, book three, book four sort of stuff. So, I mean, I, I think that Frank is kind of more guilty of this than George is. Like, in A Song of Ice and Fire, like, there are more just, like, average people who are important, you know, because of their actions. Whereas, well, I mean, you can argue the same with Frank. It, it's complicated. But I, I think that we can say that they're both guilty of this. Like, in interesting ways, but I think that, that they're both guilty of it. Um... Alyssa says, y'all are crazy. Herbert's whole point is that the prophesied hero is a terrible idea. And George's whole point about prophecy is that it's unreliable and usually results in negative consequences. Yeah, I agree, Alyssa. They both are uh, basically very skeptical and cynical about the whole idea of prophecy. 
um, deconstructs religion. Yeah, I, I mean, you can argue that Frank Herbert is uh, deconstructing prophecy and prediction in a more deep and sophisticated way than George is. Like, George is just like, hey, what if I, what if I like, told you that he's the prophesied hero, but then something else happened? Whereas Frank is like, what is the entire, like, philosophical significance of the act of prediction? Like, is prediction meaningful in a chaotic universe? Is the universe deterministic or not? You know, the fucking Heisenberg uncertainty inherent in in examining your own predictions. Like, I, I think Frank is taking a deeper look at what prescience and prophecy really means. Uh, but I think they both are, are guilty of sort of using it and abusing the concept in various ways. Um, yeah, Frank's spying on its, on its head, yeah. Uh, they, they both sort of do interesting things with it. Um, but I, I think that we can say that they're both guilty. George and Frank. It's pretty close. It's neck and neck. Bad writing cliche, number 37, burn through your plot. Um, so, so this is like, the idea is that if you have like a lot of like big ideas and plot beats that just get compressed into like a very dense, short, underexplored, like you rush through your plot too quickly is the idea. Like something that's actually really important that should be explored more just gets like mentioned and, and and passes by and i think that frank could be accused of doing this like you know for example the relationship between uh paul and Charney just sort of happens and you know some of the other like relationships specifically just sort of happen um and you know it's sort of like the political rises to power in the later books and like certain events like you know the the holy crusades like like there there are some very big things that just sort of like happen like they're just like mentioned ex ex expositorily when they could have been explored more and you know i think the reason why frank does that is because he's interested in getting to a particular point in order to explore particular ideas like it is very purposeful um Fr frank is not writing an action story he's he he's really wanting to delve into particular ideas um so you could argue that frank is guilty of this like burning through the plot in certain points uh george i think is the opposite i think george could be accused of slogging through his plot getting lost in the weeds of his plot like brienne wandering around the Riverlands and uh, and Tyrion and young Griff and Griff traveling across Essos and Illyrio and through across the East. And like, he, he doesn't burn through his plot. He gets stuck in it. The, the gardener gets lost in the weeds. Um, so I think George is not guilty of this. He's guilty of the opposite. I think that Frank could be accused of being guilty of burning through the plot. And again, like, I think it's justified, but I think that he does do it. So, what do you guys think of the live chat? Is Frank Herbert guilty of burning through the plot? Um, yeah, G yeah, George is innocent. You guys reckon Herbert is guilty? Yeah, entire universe jihaded off screen, romance is off screen. Yeah, I agree, Alyssa. Um, George has too many plot points, all of his for crows. Um, yeah, all right. I think you guys are in agreement. Frank is guilty because, yeah, huge, calamitous, significant events happen off screen. I mean, it's like that, like, Sardaukar Fremen flamethrower attack that happens off screen. Uh, yeah, Frank is guilty of that. All right. Bad writing cliche number 38. Make it hard to distinguish between characters. There's one per... <laughs> so... So the example that Joel Stickley has is there's someone called Christopher and there's another person called Chris and there's another person called Christine and another person called Christoph and it's really hard to tell tell between all these different characters. Oh my god, is George Martin guilty with all the fucking Aegons? And then the Aegons who are actually someone else and like the Griff, like th there's Griff and there's young Griff and there's Aegon the first and there's Aegon the second and there's Aegon the fifth and there's the other Aegon who might be Aegon the sixth but maybe he's not an Aegon at all. And there's like 100 characters called John. There's so many Johns. There's so many Roberts. There's multiple of so many different names. Uh, George is so fucking guilty of this. There are many characters who have the same name. And of course, you know, he does that because it's something that happens in real history. 
and real dynasties. But uh, yeah, he is absolutely guilty. Uh, Frank, I mean, there are there is like Leto the first and Leto the second and stuff like that. But I think that's the only example of people with multiple names. I mean, you know, no spoilers, but there is a <laughs> the name Duncan comes up a lot. <laughs> so. So there is a bit of that in Dune, but I think that George is far more guilty of this than than Frank is. Yeah, the Walders, there's Rob, Robert, and Robert. Uh, there's the Brandons, yeah. The, the Osman, Osfrey, and Osfred Kettleblack. Uh, yeah, incredibly guilty. George is super guilty of, of uh, confusing the names. Oh, it's close. Ooh, it's close. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, don't even get me started on the goalers in June. Okay, uh, bad writing cliche number 39. Improve the online visibility of your fiction through the careful use of keywords. <laughs> so this is a pretty modern uh, writing mistake. This is like, uh, yeah, using like uh, clickbaity terms like Britney and Bin Laden and, and nipple slip and uh, Virgin Wall, 18 years old, uh, exclusive breaking news, current stock prices. <laughs> I didn't know that this is something that writers do, but apparently some writers just load their writing with these kinds of terms in order to make them come up in uh, search terms. Jesus Michael Jackson Obama sex tape. That is an awesome name for a character. And again, uh, all credit to Joel Stickley, who wrote 100 Ways to Write Badly Well. Link in the description to go buy it to support this wonderful and funny book. Uh, so is George guilty of this? No, I don't think so. I mean, I guess you could say that he's guilty of using, like, uh, sensational, like, like uh, lurid... You know, like, there's lots of... There's lots of sex and violence in A Song of Ice and Fire. So I guess that's sort of clickbaity, but that's not really what this is about. Uh, Frank wrote Dune some 30 years before the internet existed. <laughs> um, so I don't think Frank is guilty of this. If anything, I think Frank uh, doesn't do enough to make his writing sort of catchy and lurid. So um, I would say that they both are innocent. Yeah, you guys, you guys agree. Uh... Bad writing cliche number 40, write yourself into a corner. Oh boy! <laughs> George has absolutely ridden himself into a corner. George is stuck in the deepest, darkest corner that perhaps any writer has been in in a hundred years. Uh, George has trapped himself. Uh, he, he wrote a story so complicated and so dense uh, and so popular, and he has been unable for 11 years to get the next installment out because it's just such a difficult, dense writing challenge. Expectations are so high. The TV show passed the books, and now he's starting a Duncan Egg TV show before Duncan Egg is finished. So, I, I, yes, George Martin is undoubtedly, undoubtedly guilty of writing himself into a corner. Frank Herbert, not so much. I mean, I haven't read the last couple of Dune books, so I can't really comment on that. But I mean, the first three Dune books are sort of a self-contained trilogy in and of themselves. And Frank, unlike George, he planned out that whole trilogy from the start, and he ended up where he planned to end up. So I think Frank is innocent, and I think George is guilty. Uh, do you guys agree? Yeah, I think you guys agree. Uh, all right, so George is guilty of writing himself into a corner. No doubt. Uh, it's equal. Oh my god, it's neck and neck. Frank and George in the bad writing competition are equal. Uh, number 41. Uh, bad writing cliche. Write yourself out of a corner. So this is the idea of like, if you use like a deus ex machina or something, if you use like a ridiculous uh, made up, pulled out of your ass thing in order to get your characters out of a difficult situation. Um, I don't think that George is guilty of this. I mean, George does resurrect characters on occasion, but he puts themselves into that corner for that reason. You know, like, I, 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 I don't think there are too many examples of, like, Deus Ex Machinus. I mean, I guess, like, the end of the Battle of the Blackwater, 
uh, you know, th there's a bit of Drogon ex machina sometimes, but like, you know, I, th I don't think it's excessive. I don't think it's like out of keeping with the rules of the world. I, I, I mean, there's a funny moment in this example by Joel Stickley where it says a character puts themselves in a trance where they don't have to breathe in order to get out of a difficult situation. That literally happens in June. Um, there's a bit in the first June book where Jessica gets buried in a sandslide, so she uses her Bene Gesserit body control to put herself in a coma where she doesn't need to breathe because she's a space zen master. Oh my god, maybe this is... <laughs> this feels like it could even almost be a June reference. Um, but I, I don't think... I don't think Frank is guilty of that because, like, we have been told all through the book that, like... You know, Paul and Jessica are trained in the way of the Bene Gesserit. They are able to control their bodies. Like, like this is a thing. Um, so I, I think that's fine. Um, I, I don't think that June has many moments where characters, like, just get saved Deus Ex Machina for no reason. So, yeah, I think these guys are both innocent. What do you guys think? Uh, the worm takes over... Frank guilty, but all these characters are uber mentors. I mean, like, yeah, like, absolutely, like, Frank... Frank's, like, the amazing powers of his characters get them out of bad situations. But, like, consistently so. You know? Um, Alyssa says that the Joffrey cat's paw blade is pretty suspect. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I think, is, like, George changed his mind about that particular mystery. Like, who sent the assassin to kill Bran? So that, yeah, that's sort of pulled out his ass, but that's pretty minor. Jackie says that Frank is guilty. Um, like, yeah, his characters are very powerful. Um, troubles of a god. Yeah, look, I, I think that, like, from the start, June is about, you know, the powers and the pitfalls of being super powerful. Um, yeah, a lot of you guys are saying Frank is guilty. Yeah, the courtroom. <laughs> A lot of you guys are saying Frank is guilty. I don't know if I agree, like, because because it's consistent, you know? Like, yes, like, most of the characters in Dune are, like, exceptional, powerful people with incredible capabilities, but, like... But, like, those capabilities fuck them over, like, as often as they save them, you know? Um, and that's kind of the point. I, I, I'm, go I'm gonna allow it. I'm going to allow it. I, I think I disagree with you guys. Like, yes, the power, the characters are very powerful, but, like, I think consistently so and, like, justifiably so. Uh, bad writing cliche number 42. Use quotation marks for no apparent reason. Um, I don't think... I don't think they do this. Like, just using quotation marks around, like, phrases. You know, quotation marks. I was getting worried. Are you baking? Um... Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think either author does this. Um, like, like, I guess Frank Herbert occasionally introduces like phrases and like fictional terminology, um, but I don't think he often uses quotation marks, and not in a bad way. Number forty-three: describe the wrong things. This is an interesting one. So this is the agree. This is the idea that like, so the example by Joel Stickley is that someone is in a forest and a and they get attacked by a bear and a bear comes out of nowhere. But instead of describing this terrifying bear, the text describes the ferns beneath the bear's feet, the delicate fronds pressed into the thick, wet, wet mud. So it's the idea of you, you're not describing the thing that's most important or interesting. You're describing some other thing. Now, I, I think you could accuse Frank Herbert of this because like, you know, the, the sandworms, for instance. Like, these giant fucking terrifying sandworms appear in the story every now and then. We don't get much description of what they look like. Like, we occasionally get some. We, we do occasionally get some. But, like, often it's not described very much. And, like, you know, the characters don't get described very much. Like, like you know, Charney. Like, it, it only is mentioned in book three that Charney was a redhead the whole time. Which I thought was very pertinent information. Um, and, like... You know, a, a poison snooper comes up a lot, but we never get told what a poison snooper looks like. And I think, you know, a lot of that is deliberate with Frank Herbert. Like, Frank Herbert is trying to spark our imagination, you know? Um, but I think that he should be describing things more, maybe, you know? Uh, you guys say that George is guilty of o over-describing food, and I think that that's true. George goes into detailed description uh, all the time. 
uh, of food in ways that are totally unnecessary. So yeah, I agree. Uh, I think that George is guilty there. And, you know, I think that's purposeful, you know? Like, he's trying to engage us with the vivid, you know, sensorial beauties and, and, and the genre and the feel of the world. But he focuses so much on food. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think George is guilty. A lot of you guys think Frank is guilty as well. Yeah, like, like Frank is weird. Like, like Frank doesn't describe much, honestly. Like, he describes, like, the landscape a fair bit. Uh, but in terms of actual, like, like sense, like, like what things look like and what things sound like, like, Frank doesn't really do that much at all. Um, Jack says that under-describing is not the same as describing the wrong things. That's true. Like, I, I don't think Frank ever says, like, a giant sandworm reared up ahead and Paul Paul's left boot was very itchy because of the particular grains of sand. Actually, it kind of fucking does do that. Like, 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 fr like Frank goes into great detail about, like, pea sand and grit sand and flower sand and all the different kinds of sand. What about the worms, Frank? Tell me about the worms. <laughs> um, and yeah, George also does his, like, food, food description stuff when he could probably be describing other stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like they're both guilty. I feel like they're both guilty. Like, like they're sort of guilty in different ways because George describes, like, you know food and uh battles and armor when he could be describing other stuff um whereas yeah I, i'm gonna say they're both guilty frank describes the rings on the worms yeah he describes the rings on the worms and the crystal teeth but uh, uh, not enough all right um we're gonna say frank's guilty he describes the wrong stuff sometimes and i think george describes uh the food too much Okay, um, they, they do both have strange descriptions. Bad writing cliche number 44, censor your characters. Uh, so this is like, instead of swearing, you have like little euphemistic swearing instead of like real swearing. And I don't think they do this. I mean, I don't think characters really swear at all in Dune, but it's not like censored. Um, and in... A Song of Ice and Fire, there is some swearing. There's not, like, a heap of swearing. Unless you're talking about Shitmouth. In the A Song of Ice and Fire um, books, there is a character called Shitmouth who is uh, famous for swearing all the time. And he is not censored at all, you better believe. Uh, would, would, would you like to see some of uh, Shitmouth's inspiring quotes? Uh, Sir used to call me Shitmouth, if it please me, Lord. Me? A lord? Shit, no. Bugger me with a bloody spear. Bugger me with a bloody spear. Uh, rotted and et. That fat bugger got most, my lord. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, so, no. I, I don't think either Frank or George are guilty of censoring themselves. And yeah, not just swearing, but with, you know, sex and stuff. George does not self-center either. So, neither are guilty. Bad writing cliche number 45. Be clear about what objects can and can't do. Uh... So I think the idea here is that sometimes sometimes writing can like overly describe what things are and what things do to an extent that is excessive. Like we don't need to know that socks make your feet warm. We know that, you know, so it's like unnecessary description of things. Um, and I don't think Frank or George are guilty of this. I mean, I think sometimes Frank especially is guilty of not explaining enough what things do. Like, some of the technologies and, like, how they work. Um, but, like, yeah, no, I, I think these, these guys are both innocent, aren't they? Y you guys think both are guilty? I don't think they're guilty. Like, I guess, Frank, you could say he over-explains, like, how shields work sometimes. Um... Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think they're guilty. Uh, moving on to bad writing cliche number forty-six: drop in and out of reported dialogue for no clear reason. So this is when, like, you go from the characters saying things to each other, but suddenly it just skips into a description of dialogue, and then back into actual dialogue. That does happen sometimes in Dune. Um, like sometimes a character, like start, like sometimes they start a conversation. And then the character like says, and then I, and then he described the thing that happened before, and then they go back into normal dialogue, like I, it's like that burning through the story thing that we talked about, number thirty-seven. Um, I think that Frank does sometimes skip over 
like the boring dialogue to get to the good stuff, which is like a reasonable thing to do. Um, this, this, the cliche is doing it for no clear reason. So I, I think that Frank is innocent of this. Uh, George, I think, is very innocent of this. I can't think of examples of George just describing dialogue instead of having dialogue. So yeah, I think these guys are both innocent. Yeah, you guys say both innocent. All right, we're in agreement. This is like a court of law. This is fun. Bad writing cliche number 47, use very specific reference points in your similes. So this is like an, an overly uh, specific uh, simile. So it's like, if you say that something is as tall as a specific birch tree in a specific place, as wide as the bonnet of a specific mo model of car. Did George or Frank do this? I mean, I'd, it's funny to me that Frank Herbert often describes deserts and sand and the color of deserts and sand as being like curry. Which to me is like a terrible description because curry can come in many different colors. That's why there's green curry and red curry, curry and everything in between. Um, so I feel like Frank sometimes does weird stuff like this, but not all that often. Not honest, not often enough to be weird. Um, George does use some very specific reference points, like a penis being like a fat pink mast and a vulva being like a murish swamp. That's a pretty specific reference point, George. Um, but I think these are mostly like pretty isolated examples. Uh, what, what do you guys think? Do Frank and George use overly specific reference points for their similes? I, I don't think so. Uh, strong as a bull. Uh, ox, yeah, strong as an ox and strong as an aurochs. Uh, large rose pole. Yeah, I, I think there are like some little examples, but I, I don't... I don't think these guys are guilty of this. Moving on to bad writing cliche number 48. When writing radio drama, use dialogue to set the scene. Um, th this is not radio drama, so it's not relevant here. Uh, but this is like the example of um, using the dialogue to describe like the setting and the blocking and like what's physically happening in ways that aren't realistic dialogue. Uh, but it, it's, you know, it, this is not how those books are written, so it's fine. Um, bad writing cliche number 49, romanticize places. Uh, so here, uh, Joel Stickley describes a place that is horrible, but he likes it anyway. Uh, it's a place that is known for decapitation uh, and, uh, and uh, needles on the ground, but this person really likes this place anyway. Uh, and that's interesting because, like, you know, in A Song of Ice and Fire, Westeros is a pretty horrible place, right? Um, like, there's a lot of death and starvation and horror. But George is sometimes romantic about it. I mean, even battlefields, you know? Like, like George talks about how he, he loves, like, the beauty and the excitement of a battlefield. I mean, Eustace Osgury in the Swan Sword Duncan Egg book talks about, oh, you know, all those dying men on the bloody battlefield but the but the rising sun or the or the setting sun was red and it was so beautiful so that is an example of this like george martin in a song of ice and fire he does sometimes romanticize places that are terrible um and i guess frank does as well right with arrakis because arrakis is a terrible place arrakis is a place uh, of like a, a, a horrible harsh environment where sometimes you gotta like kill to like get the water to survive you literally have to drink your own recycled pee and poop in order to survive on Arrakis in the desert and yet he romanticizes it he says that you know God made Arrakis to train the train the faithful we need the suffering of Arrakis in order to make us strong and there's a very specific idea around like adversity promoting growth and like harsh environments being needed for human evolution so frank is guilty i think of romanticizing the horrible place that is arrakis um quite explicitly uh and yeah george is as well he he romanticizes the horrible poverty ridden blood-soaked world of westeros so yeah i think they are both guilty what do you guys think Summer Isles. Yeah, yeah, I think George Martin overly romanticizes the Summer Isles in a way that is over the top. It's just this paradise. Um, yeah, Arrakis is bad. 
Uh, Alyssa says, you guys seem really eager to call guilty on everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to be too harsh, but uh, I think that it, in this case, it is a pretty consistent recurring thing in both of these stories that they romanticize horrible places. Uh, Evan says that George is a conscientious objector uh, who loves war. Yeah, there is a funny tension there. And I mean, George does explore that tension explicitly. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's definitely something that uh, they are both guilty of. All right, so George and Frank are guilty of romanticizing some pretty horrible places. Uh, bad writing cliche number 50, fail to notice are missing during editing. So basically editing mistakes. Um, uh, so just like typos and like things that uh, should have been edited out but weren't. There are some small mistakes in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like there's a horse that changes sex and Renly's eye color changes. There are also some issues in Dune where like, you know, the timeline doesn't add up in the appendices with uh, Shaddam the Fourth and stuff. Um mostly minor things in the actual like print publications and ebook publications of june there actually are a lot of typos uh in june that haven't been corrected um which i think might have something to do with like you know june was originally in print and then they made ebooks and new editions by like scanning the paper and digitizing the paper which introduced errors is i i imagine that's what happened there um so should we ding that i mean i i, I imagine that the actual like first publications of june didn't have these errors I, well i don't know I, I don't i don't know um there are minor issues but not big issues i would say with both these guys so you know should we ding them what do you guys think are they guilty of failing to notice er uh editing issues yeah jane westerling's hips are another thing that change um both innocent both innocent all right we're going to call them innocent for this Okay, so um, we've reached the 50th bad writing cliche out of 100, and I think we're going to pause the stream here. We're going to end the stream here, and we're going to do a second half uh, later on. Um, so thank you so much for participating. If there's anything uh, that you reckon we missed or anything you'd like me to address, chuck it in the live chat now if you've got any burning thoughts or any questions we can address them um i would like to acknowledge uh this book 100 ways to write badly well by joel stickley that's what we're using as like the structure of this video and there's a link in the description if you'd like to go and buy that book or if you'd like to check it out uh i think it's uh, a cool book and i thank joel stickley for putting it out there um thank you to everybody who gave super chats uh, appreciate you, Angela, Gladys, uh, Darren, uh, my age, Andrew, um, Harry T. Uh, and thank you to Jez, who said, don't mean to kill the flow. Uh, got stuff to do, but really into this. Don't want to miss it. Um, cool. All right. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? Do another Goosebumps. <laughs> uh, do JK Rowling. That'd be fun. Three hours of nit picking. What is wrong with us? But it's so fun to pick nits. I mean, we can look. We can think a bit more deeply about this. Obviously, I mean, because because like one of I mean, something that happened over and over uh, while we were doing this is that we we found that George and Frank are guilty of many of these writing cliches and mistakes. But here's the thing: like Frank and George are not bad writers. Obviously, I mean, I think some of these things are things that make their stories worse but but for the most part um you know a lot of the times when they are guilty of these things it doesn't actually make the story worse it makes it better because they're like subverting certain ideas or they're like breaking rules for good reasons like picasso doing like non-representational like weird abstract experimental art good art breaks rules so i don't think that like frank or george are bad writers um, for making these mistakes or these cliches. I think that in in some ways it's actually the mark of a really good artist and a good writer that they're breaking rules and doing weird shit. Um, so I think it's an interesting reflection on, you know, what it means to make art. Um, and I think we should, you know, think deeply about 
why we are doing the things that we do creatively and like what like when we are making a good decision to do something unconventional and when we're making a bad decision to do something unconventional uh anakin says learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist yeah uh lightbringer says that these authors are choosing to use these tropes to skewer them or to add commentary yeah sometimes it's about like recognizing historical realities sometimes it's about subverting tropes sometimes it's about fucking with our expectations for pure entertainment value um so yeah you can break these rules for good or for bad schubert says martin cordial versus jk rowling i have a feeling that martin cordial the famous uh, author martin cordial might be coming out with some new material on the martin cordial youtube channel or on the random article podcast i think that um could be some more coming from martin cordial soon um are we ever getting a dune series on the main channel uh i uh i have heard that um my nemesis alt shift x will be dropping some very large dune videos on alt shift x soon yes okay uh let's end it here thank you so much for participating everybody this was fun uh the the score is dead even uh, I was not expecting that. I don't know how this is going to end. I'm very excited to find out on our next live stream uh, who is mathematically, scientifically, the best writer, George Martin or Frank Herbert. We'll find out in the next live stream. Can't wait. All right. See you guys. <laughs>